Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Turnips Digest, starting at Saturday, 8 o'clock a.m. Central Time, right on time once again. Um, before we start, I might uh, point you to the description. If you'd like what is being done here, then please consider donating or supporting through Subscribestar. Um, hopefully, with the way that my schooling is going, I will have something that is actually unique for subscribers over at Subscribestar. Uh, in the coming few months, I have a lot of papers that I now have time to work on. Uh, but, you know, of course, only if these things interest you, if you find value in them, in them then only then consider donating. Uh, but all of that is uh, secondary to what we are doing today. I am joined by Mr. Panama Hat. How are you, sir? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. And um, I, I have to say, I noticed how you you introduced the stream with the uh, with the date. I, I don't know if this is something that you do in all Christian churches, but I know in the Catholic Church we do this. Uh, you know, we introduce the days. For example, I think this would be what the fourteenth Saturday of all, in in ordinary time. You know, the, um, uh, with, the with the with the calendar. I, I right. wonder if I wonder if we should start. We should introduce this, this, the streams that way. You know, in, you know. in accordance with the liturgical calendar. <laughs> I will, uh, and then the one that we're using, I think it will be the, I think it's also like probably the 14th Sunday after Holy Trinity, uh, um, or something like yes, that, I forget sorry. the actual numbers, like we're in the double digits, but, uh, so, you know, I, I can very well could start doing that, that would yes. be fantastic. We should, we should, we should, we should, we should, we should ring the bell to, to, to summon the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, we'll open up with, like, a psalm reading or something. Yes, exactly, yeah. which we have to sing. <laughs> uh, that would be fantastic. So, um, I remember, we have discussed the topic we are going to uh, talk about today already on another stream, but we only have. for about, like, 15 minutes. Uh, yes. I am being joined by you to discuss hymns, Mr. Panama Hat. Um, well, yes, yeah. I mean, this is going to be a very, very cozy stream, I think. Yes, uh, cozy stream, and... I uh, threw this one together sort of like as the uh, stub stream just because uh, I am limited in time today. We've only got a couple hours as opposed to the uh, four and a half that we had last week. <laughs> so uh, so what, are we looking at about two hours? Yeah, yeah, give or take. Okay, that's that's actually pretty good. I think that's a, a decent length to discuss this kind of thing. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I suppose that if we brought somebody on who was like a real music kind of an, an artist, then along with you, they could kind of go into the real you know, the, the, the depths of, of, of hymnal music. But uh, this is going to be a far more uh, casual affair, I think. Um, right. Just a kind and, of sort of passing around of, of hymns that we enjoy and, you know. Uh, right. And uh, I was actually uh, talking to you before we started uh, that there is question as to whether or not there is a hymn, not like a psalm, but a hymn written into scripture that is quoted by Paul. Yes. And uh, I will try to find that one really quickly here. Uh, it's, you talk, uh, was it, it wasn't uh, Colossians. Uh, this is Colossians 1, 15 through 20, if I remember correctly. And can I check which version you're using just so we can see? Well, that? yeah, uh, I, I was just using the new King James, but like I new can... King James, okay. Yeah, I, I can switch to King James. Or, like, sort it's of all a in there. slightly off-topic question, but do, what, actually, what actually is the new King James? Because I'm aware of what the King James is. It, but... Okay, so... I was uh, talking to Stephen about this. It is a, uh, it it keeps sort of the poetic element of the King James version. So right. the songs are still very much readable. Um, it just uh, it modernizes sort of the archaicisms without going fully okay. into uh, the vulgar, uh, you know, common speech. I see. Uh, okay. I will. I will. I will still adhere to the pure traditional King James version. For, <laughs> for its glorious uh, yeah, language. This one shouldn't be too terribly uh, no. different across uh, translations, uh, but um, I will. Uh, I have a screenshot of this. I will throw it up onto the screen. But while I do that, I might as well explain the reason that many people think that this is a uh, hymn that has just been thrown into scripture or quoted by Saint Paul in his epistle to the Colossians is because uh, uh, if you if you read it, and we will, uh, I will demonstrate this very quickly. Suddenly, it goes very uh, poetic. Um, if I remember correctly, I think someone claimed it had a meter, but I don't know if that is relevant to the version. Um, and in fact, I will just uh, throw this up now, and hopefully, everything is visible because I have not tried to just throw, you know, block uh, passages from scripture onto the screen. But here goes nothing, anyways. So. Um, visible? Everything all right? Um, yeah, I can see it. All right. So, uh, this is just a quote from, uh, 
Colossians chapter 1, uh, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So this is obviously translated to get meaning across uh, mm -hmm. rather than just keep the uh, what I presume to be the Greek poetic element or uh, would it be Aramaic? I have I don't quite remember. I think, well, I, I think yeah. that the the I, I think what would Paul have, Paul may have done it in Aramaic, but. I think the translation everybody works from is the Greek, isn't it? Right, right, yeah. The, the uh, yeah I, I knew Greek as the original, like, quote, unquote, mm. the original that we have. But, yes. um, yeah. Uh, so, obviously, this has been translated multiple times. Um, and if you contrast that to just a few verses beforehand, um, he is uh, speaking a, just slightly different. I won't throw this one up on the screen because I'll just be scrambling to get, uh, you know, quotes and pictures up this entire time. Uh, but I'll just star a couple of verses beforehand uh, to uh, kind of highlight how uh, how this might change across a, uh, or how this might change across his own letter. Um, he he says just a few verses beforehand um, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So, you know, it goes from very sort of uh, explanative or analytical, and then suddenly he just starts mm. extolling, you know, the power of christ basically in these five hymns or in these five verses rather so um this leads people to uh basically believe that it's a that it's a hymn and it, it goes on two verses afterwards that gets split up uh depending on what version you're using uh, which is uh why the difference in translation might matter because there will be different headers at different points in the uh, scripture uh depending on uh where you are in scripture uh, you know, for instance, the uh, Ten Commandments aren't numbered. <laughs> that that yes, is, uh, that is right. something that we do, um, mm -hmm. which we is why do. there's a difference between, I think, the way that it falls is the Reformed and the Orthodox number theirs the same way, and the Lutherans and the Catholics number theirs mm -hmm. the same way. Uh, so, you know, the, you get these differences, and uh, where do you split up Scripture to make it make sense? Yes, um, you do. So, you know, the thing that I have up on screen here is this 15 through 18. If you want to read the full thing, I by all means, I encourage you to. Uh, the purpose for having this on the screen right now, though, is just to, uh, just to show that uh, this has potential to be, you know, biblical. Uh, you know, very, very literally biblical. This is in Scripture. This is Paul writing in his epistle, the Apostle Paul writing in his epistle to the Colossians, um, you know, potentially quote, quoting a hymn. Um, so this goes back um, basically two thousand years, and if this isn't if this is apocryphal, if uh, what I'm saying is not true, um, then it goes back to you know just the uh, you know the fourth century. You know. Yes. Um, now I, I don't know if it's uh, I'm I may be con conjecturing here because I haven't looked into the history of mm -hmm. him specifically not not for a long time anyway, and I'm aware that. Um, uh, I believe the roots of it, as we know it today, were in the were in the chanting of monks, which is, I believe, the root of pretty much most Christian music. Um, right. It was the, the 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 prayers to to song of monks, and and then I know that um, in Europe, the singing of songs at masses. Um, I think it took quite a while to catch on, didn't it? There was quite some resistance to it for a bit. Um, right. And I'm and I'm aware that the introduction of organs um very early on was 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 a major upheaval and it was it was considered this terrible modern racket um <laughs> and i i, I remember re I, there was a a manuscript of a of a, of a priest i think a, 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 a bishop who was writing to complain of an organ that had been installed that had six notes and he said it's like six notes like this <laughs> we don't need six notes this is this is you know <laughs> this is pointless you know rackets you know we don't need this kind of thing um 
Yeah. Right, and if you want to extend that heritage even farther, um, the reason that we have monks singing and the reason that we even have music during the services is because in scripture we have an entire base, basically an entire songbook mm -hmm. that was written that was meant for the uh, for the worship of the congregation or for the yes. uh, uh, for the kingdom of David um, for the temple itself, you know, uh, and that's why. Uh, that's that's why uh, half the psalms basically just say to uh, you know sing a psalm of sing a song of worship to God or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, paraphrasing for like the hundred times it gets said, um, and that and so if if you trace this lineage out across the timeline here, assuming and this is a faulty assumption because it's not true that the psalms were the first music specifically written for um, you know uh, worship for the Christians pre Christ. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this goes back to, you know, the times of Babylon and Assyria and, uh, you know, before Rome was even a, uh, was even a, uh, something thought of by man. Yeah. So, uh, this, this has a very ancient heritage. Um, obviously we trace this in the West too, as, uh, as you said, the, uh, use of, uh, music and, uh, in the mass by the monks and the monasteries. Um, uh, so this, a lot of people might, uh, Especially the Americans might instinctively look on these uh, two, uh, look onto these two uh, influences here and think that they're two Roman Catholic. But uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised how many hymns just come from uh, you know translating and uh, putting uh, the you know chants into meter uh, from the Roman Catholic. That so, wasn't written by a Quaker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, oh well, yeah, you can tell it's not written by a Quaker because it has yeah. substance, but uh, we'll, exactly. take my, uh, we'll take my uh, side into, swiping. Into the nominational volume <laughs> already. Yes. Um, well, well, of course, um, so uh, before I ask you about um, kind of uh, the American Lutheran um, sort of engagement with hymns, Mm -hmm. um of course i wanted to we mentioned that the the, the chance of the monks there um and i think that you know the blurring between hymns and what we would call sort of like common music um it can be blurred i mean obviously one of the most famous of the um of the ancient not not ancient exactly but sort of early medieval monk, monk chants was of course the dies irae um mm -hmm. and you know you'll you'll hear that that melody used i mean uncountable amounts of times in in other works of music right because it because it signifies um it sort of signifies evil and uh and sort of and sort of repentance and comeuppance and things like that um, right um and I, I was it um was it was it Berlio? i think was the first composer to use it in the in the modern sense or something like that um man i, I want to uh, say it was that sounds Right, uh, because obviously when you hear it now, it, it, and whenever used in music, it's just symbolic of death. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas beforehand, it was a uh, you know in the actual lyrical uh, meaning, it's a it's a very uh, gruesome call to repentance, if you will. It really is. It's it's one of those. Uh, I mean, the thing is, I I I do think that um, that I think that Christ Christianity in the in the modern world has lost a lot of its bite. Mm -hmm. um, you know because. That 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 terrifying side of, of the church, that that call to repentance, that 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 reminder of eternal damnation, it's an important part of the faith. It's an integral part of it because you know that's that's why we are God fearing. You know, it's not it's it's you you you're you're bowing down before the eternal deity of the known universe. I mean, this isn't really something to be taken lightly. Um, and I I, I, th I think that the kind of um more forgiving more wholesome side of christianity should also be balanced with that kind of fearing side um that we've kind of lost now i mean there's a there's, there's a very haunting spanish tune called um uh, pecador contempla which literally means um sinner like it basically means sinner repent and it's just it's a very sort of calming sort of almost romantic sounding tune or ballad played on a guitar Mm -hmm. But the lyrics are just the most horrifying, sort of existentially terrifying thing it's possible to hear. I think, right? Um, and yeah. you you mentioned that you know you have to balance out these uh you know this more wholesome side with the uh, fearing side, and it's mm -hmm. the the very fact that you fear God that will cause you to really appreciate mm -hmm. anything that God has given you, even if they're hardships. Um, and that's that's why if you go back to especially the older chants, the older hymns, um. 
anything, you know, anything old that we don't necessarily see in the modern day very popularly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the music will be talking about just the absolute fear of God that these men have. Yes. Um, you know, a, a modern mind, uh, when reading something like, you can s just throw out like a very popular example, you can say a modern mind might read uh, Cosmic Horror uh, in the vein of Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. And gods are made there to be terrifying from the perspective of a per of a man writing it. Yes. Um, and, you know, th those gods aren't even, you know, obviously they're fictional. But if you were to say they are real, they're not omnipotent, they're not omniscient, and they're not omnipresent. No. Yeah. Uh, the Christian god... If you were to, if you are to take him as real, which you and I do, and many others do, um, he is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. You know, he is. A, we have no other way to really uh, conceptualize. You know, given outside of this vague sort of scope that we've just thrown out there in those three words, you know, the absolute power that he has. So, thing. yes. So this is good and bad. Yeah, you, you you should be fearful, and then that brings you to repentance, and then obviously. As a uh, as a result, you get take, uh, taken to the uh, more wholesome side. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you you need one and then the other. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and this is this is what you would see in those old hymns, like or these old chants, rather the old music tradition, like DSRI. Um, be just because uh, you have a lot of very beautiful, very wholesome chants from that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, not in the same way that like a Christian song might be mistaken for a love song in the modern day if you were to take the v absolute newest ones. Mm -hmm. um, these things are just are basically sung poetry or chanted poetry back yes. in the, uh, from the medieval era. Very, very um, intricately um, constructed Latin uh, poetry as well. It's, it's quite incredible. Um, written, of course, um, Dies Irae is written in uh, triplicates. Um, yes. it's in, it's in, it's in what are essentially stanzas of three, um, that rhyme all the way through. Um, and, uh, <laughs> of course it's, there's a reason we don't often write poetry like that in English is because English is so rhyme poor, whereas Latin <laughs> and, uh, Romance languages, especially Italian are rhyme rich. It's very easy to rhyme. So yeah. that's why, for example, Dante, um, was yeah. able to write the, the Commedia in, um, Terza Rima. Which is a very, very, very complicated rhyme-heavy meter. Which is, I mean, you can write in it in English, but you know, I, you know, pity the man who wants to write a, a three-volume epic in it. So, yeah, right, uh, that was something that I wondered in grade school. Was uh, I was told that you know the Divine Comedy uh, was originally just a whole work of poetry, mm -hmm. and you know, originally I just thought, oh, this must be like a non-rhyming poetry or something because it's impossible to write an entire like basically an epic and in, in rhyming poetry uh no uh it's just it, language matters here and that's something mm -hmm. that uh that the public schools necessarily didn't uh hammer into my mind at the very least too well, terribly yes. much this is this is one of the advantages of being italian basically it's, it's a very <laughs> rhyme rich language um i mean yeah. obviously you, you compare that to the great english epic you know which is arguably paradise lost mm -hmm. which is entirely in blank verse of course it doesn't rhyme. right it's it's in meter it's in iambic pentameter but it doesn't rhyme Right, and so whenever we get to the music heritage of Christendom, uh, the language does make a difference, um, and that's especially why uh, I, I need to uh, phrase this in a way that does not immediately sound uh, patronizing just because it's not. Um, the trads have something very heavily into their advantage in that the uh, Latin language that they, that they like, and Latin is a beautiful language, it naturally lends itself towards uh, having a very uh, beautiful set of rhyming, uh, just regardless of basically of whatever you're talking about, with mm -hmm. with very few exceptions. So, if you wanted to, you can make the entire service, which has been done, sound like poetry. Yes. Well, I mean, this is this is my this is the great pain I feel upon the loss of the traditional liturgy is because. Mm -hmm you're not only communicating with your ancestors, your Christian ancestors, in a way that goes back to the earliest, I mean, even even really, you're, you're going back to some things which are, you know, pre the time of Christ. Um, you're also just losing that poetry. I mean, of course, you know, you know, blame me to bring old uh, Nicholas <laughs> Gomez into this as usual. But of course, he has, he has this, this, Quite simple, but quite 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 wonderful line that when you remove the Latin and you you bring the liturgy in 
you bring the liturgy into the vulgar tongue and it becomes vulgar <laughs> you know that's it 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 loses something of its of its mystical poetic edge you know it, it doesn't it doesn't i mean it, it it almost sounds like a kind of argument to kind of bamboozle the, the praying masses but i mean it it literally loses some of that mystic and shine and magic you know of hearing these liturgies in in latin i think i've i've i attend um uh, latin masses um semi semi regularly um and you know just i i always just regret that all the masses aren't still like that you know because it is so there is something wonderful about it Right. Now, you and I will obviously disagree there, and hence, yeah. our, uh, <laughs> hence our difference in denomination. But um, there is... So the thing that I... Yeah, let me preface this. I came from Southern Baptism, and the way that the services are conducted there is you, you only sing basically when the congregation sings. Uh, you know, discounting the more modern sort of megachurch-style thing where you just have, like, praise bands and all this other stuff. Yes. Like, yeah. The... Uh, Damn the older the guitars, <laughs> <laughs> the older uh, service style for the Baptist basically was uh, most things uh, were basically spoken unless you sang a hymn. Mm. Um, and then when I went to Lutheranism, like I had no clue that there is a whole separate sort of family of uh, Christian denominations where the services uh, chanted or sang. Uh, you know, like there, there's a liturgy. You know, that is something that is absent from a lot of American uh, Protestantism. Uh, in, in the various other denominations. And uh, so, you know, I, uh, I, I understand the sort of uh, the conception that if you were to translate all of this, it sort of loses mysticism. Uh, but I would counter that just by saying that if you chant or sing these things, uh, mm -hmm. there's just going to be an inherent uh, sort of mysticism in, it, in that music is mystical, um, or at the very least, sacred music is mystical. Um, yes, which is... Which is, and you can see this admitted even by the secular people. Uh, whenever uh, in movies or something like that, if you enter a, like a Roman church or something, the plot moves toward to a cathedral. Or if you're in a horror genre and you have something in a religious setting, there will be some sort of church music used, and it's not just to generate atmosphere mm -hmm. or just to like hammer over the head. Hey, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're in a religious environment now. It's because the uh, the music that you would usually use in a church. Uh, has a sort of ethereal feeling to it, like something that is uh, non-physical, something that might haunt you, potentially. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, even the secular people will admit that sacred music has a sort of haunting feeling to it, uh, which is which I would say is undeniably true. Uh, but uh, with all this being said, of course, we, <laughs> we are just sort of extolling the virtues of hymnody, which uh, I can't imagine many people would say that hymns are bad or... Uh, no. <laughs> so uh but you know hopefully well, what we is can... the what is the puritan view on hymns and, and and church music let me see if i remember correctly i think the puritans did have their own musical tradition right. um it's the sort of banning music in church i believe comes from more of the continental reformed uh tradition earlier on right and and i'm sure there were several puritan sects that banned uh hymns um but i remember uh zwingli if i remember correctly Mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that he himself was a very brilliant musician, uh, you know, banned uh, music in church, if I remember correctly, as did a few of the Dutch Reformed. Um, right. And this would later be relaxed under the, uh, basically under the idea that the Psalms is music directly given to us by God. There is no need for human uh, tamper tamperment other than the mm -hmm. translation, of course. Um and so basically you just uh, you start chanting psalms. And we did a uh, stream with a couple of our Calvinist friends on the Scottish Reformation. And they brought up in there the chanting of the psalms being uh, brought to Christendom by the, uh, by the Calvinists, if I remember correctly, is what they said. Right. Um, and so that's, uh, you start with that development there. Uh, in the Western world, uh, people start putting the psalms back to music, uh, which... We did in the medieval era, but I, if I remember correctly, by the time of the Reformation, it had kind of gone by the wayside. Okay. Um, and uh, then, you know, you sort of have the songs being sung once again in uh, national languages and the vulgar tongue, if you will. Um, then you have the question, you know, what if I just slightly paraphrase the psalms to where it gets absolutely no questions asked, the point across still. Um, it's still a song, a psalm rather, but, you know, now there's like a... Uh, uh, it's not just chanting, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how you get uh, pieces of music or hymns or carols like Joy to the World. Yes. So, um, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a long progression there. Um, but the Puritans themselves, if I remember correctly, had hymns. Um, I just... I have not studied uh, Pur- Puritan uh, you know, musical theology, though. No. <laughs> Which, uh, in, in fact, I have uh, gone to perhaps the opposite, um, just with the hymns that I now know uh, outside of my Baptist upbringing. Um, mm-hmm. They're all very old. Uh, which is something that astounded me when I was in Lutheranism, and I'm sure the uh, Anglicans, or even potentially if there is a Roman Catholic hymn book out there, I don't know if that's considered a, you know, modern or if it has a liberal um, There are many, some official, some unofficial. Um, right. And there have been, I mean, I further on I will bring up uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins um, and his kind of Catholic hymn tradition, but generally, I mean, Again, I, I really do hope I'm not putting a foot wrong here and missing something out. But mm-hmm. I have to say that um, obviously it's, I didn't I didn't grow up a Catholic or really um, Christian at all. Um, so the the influence I had was mainly via a- Anglicanism through school. We would sing hymns uh, in every assembly, um, pretty much every day. That that would be for a certain amount mm-hmm. of time. Um, and of course, we had regular chapel um, services, which were compulsory. When I was in boarding school, we had one on a Wednesday morning and one on a Sunday afternoon, um, which were both compulsory, um, where hymns would be sung as well. All, all Anglican, of course. So, I mean, and then when I got into Catholicism later on, um, there didn't really seem to be a hymn tradition at all. And, and like I said, um, the, um, the hymns that I have, we have sung so far in the Catholic churches here in Wales have all been ones that I was familiar with from Anglican days. Um, and in, in fact, uh, one of the most memorable masses I attended was the Easter of 2020. Um, oh. where I, was, I was at the Metropolitan C- Cathedral in Cardiff and the bishop was present for the mass. And um, we sang a, a Welsh, an old Welsh hymn as he, as he entered. And then he took to the, uh, took to the lectern and said, uh, Good old Methodist tune there, <laughs> 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 uh, Which is quite and, good, yeah. and yeah, that's the other thing here as well. Um, if you open a hymnal, um, you will find something from basically everyone. Uh, yeah. That's the, and and we'll get into that uh, later. Great, and I great, the great sharing of of, of yeah. uh, sort of of Christian song. I mean, I I think the thing is, no matter what denomination you are, a good tune is a good tune. You know, it's 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 very difficult to resist uh, resist a good hymn, even if it's not strictly one of yours. Um, right, and that's and that's just because there's a uh, <laughs> when you don't have a uh, theologian speaking for an ex- <laughs> enormous amount of time, when you're only limited to like six or seven verses, or at the least two. Um, you know, there's only so much you can say. Well, this is and the thing. Yes. Usually with hymns, you're trying to get a very basic truth across so that people can remember it, take delight in it, you know, so they can sing it joyfully. It's, it's basically worship God is the, yeah, yeah. the is, and we, we take joy in worship. I mean, it's it's not like you have like a, uh, say, a, a, a Lutheran hymn that's just, uh, we love solar scripture, et etc. et cetera. Like, it's like, it's, <laughs> it, it, like that, because that, that wouldn't really work as a hymn, would it? You, you, can't, you would have I, to I, rhyme I sola scriptura <laughs> with something. Uh, um, and, and of course, there are... Uh, uh, there are ways to communicate, you know, faith and scripture. Um, and if, I think we do have one hymn that will say uh, maybe even like uh, faith alone or something like that. But even then, that is still just quoting scripture, yeah. um, which. So you, you can get into these uh, these uh, gray areas and there are hymns that do get relegated by denomination. Uh, like there are hymns that are so, uh, you know, very directly, say, Lutheran, we'll keep with the example, uh, that you probably won't find them, say, in a uh, Calvinist denomination. But uh, but you might still change the lyrics, which is something else that happens is you just change like the three words that bother you and then suddenly the hymn's there. Yes. Uh, which <laughs> um, which which is another common thing, of course. Hymns do sort of go through go through phases. Um, there's there's, a, there's actually a big uh, variation here between hymns that were written by Welsh clergymen mm-hmm. um, and ones that then end up in in the sort of circulation of Anglican hymns. Um, very often because they were literally translating from old Welsh folk songs. Um, also because 
I know that um, the infamous. Um, are we t- we are talking about the same Charles Wesley, aren't we? Uh, uh, Charles, yeah, the Wesley brothers. Charles, so. Charles Wesley and the the, the the great Wesleyan heresy as such. Um, was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, that. we both got our sides wiped <laughs> out. That's the uh, that's the quota for the stream. But, uh, but of course, he was a, he was a he was a prolific hymn writer who wrote, according to this, over six thousand five hundred yep. hymns in his life, and many of them have become great standards of all Christian faiths. And um, also some of them are very famous one and out Christmas carols, including Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which we will go into uh, in a, in a right. short while. Right, or even slightly less known, but still very beautiful, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. Yes, um, now, which is which is a very, I think it's, it's in the top five Anglican hymns, actually, that one. And that would make sense. Uh, and, that, you know, that's the that's the big fact that every person will throw at you if you mention the Wesley brothers was they never actually left the Anglicans. You know, they, no. <laughs> uh, so, um, but, uh, yeah, so this is uh, just to keep with the, the point that I was making and then we'll move on slightly because there is something really cool that I do want to show people. Like, it just astounds me that we have it. Um, you know, Lohi comes with clouds ascending. Um, there is language in there that will get edited across denominations. Mm-hmm. Um, because the second line, basically, uh, or actually the first two lines is low, he comes with clouds descending. That's a pattern you see with a lot of hymns, is they will just make the title the first line, if yes. there isn't something uh, commonly that's commonly known, known by. Um, and the second line, once for favored sinner slain. Um, this will get changed depending on the do- denomination, uh, depending on what their view of election is. So chosen, mm-hmm. favored, uh, you know, would indicate a much more uh, sort of Calvinistic view of election. Yes. Um, and it will take me just one second here to actually find what the Lutherans have, if you want to uh, uh, carry on from anything there, Panama. Well, um, well, I was I was going to say, would, would, would the Lutherans have any qualm with the thousand, thousand saints attending? Uh, I don't actually know that one off the because top I, of my I, head. It's, I mean, it's it's not because I know that, obviously, the, the, the saints tradition... Mm-hmm. Is um, a little bit more weighted towards the Catholic end of things, and I know that. Don't correct me if I'm wrong. Lutherans do have saints, right? It's not yes, like, yes, uh, yes. Uh, in a slightly different way than that. That's a topic for another time. But the uh, summary is that the Lutherans will say that uh, anyone that is Christian and you know obviously goes, yeah, it goes before you is a saint. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't quite have the elaborate canonization process no, of but, it, but it does work it's not yes. it's, it's not like an error according correct to we have saints yes um okay. and yeah so i unless there's something other but so with that low he comes to uh, class ascending in the lutherans it changes from favored sinners to every sinner oh i see <laughs> okay. so uh you know just right. you know you get subtle changes like that and mm. of course if we were if this is like if every uh, Christian was a theologian, I'm sure there would be great uproar about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in reality, in reality, such a minor change, bringing in such a beautiful piece of music and language, uh, mm-hmm. such a beautiful extillation of a virtue of the virtue of Christ, uh, you know, just changing one word, you know, two syllables to two syllables, uh, is a very simple fix for such a beautiful hymn. Just to yes. have it in churches, so you get you get very nice things like that. Um, now, the other thing that I was wanting to look at, and I was mentioning mentioning this to you uh, before we started, Panama, um, is that you can actually find in hymn books still in use today, hymns from the fourth century. Yes. Um, specifically written by Saint Ambrose. Um, now, of course, this will have to have been translated multiple times over and uh, made fit meter. Um, you know, Saint Ambrose was probably <laughs> was writing in uh, Latin. Uh, but uh, so we don't quite sing Latin hymns, at least in the Lutheran Church. We may actually have a Latin hymn book somewhere. It would not surprise me, uh, yeah, but so it's not what many people Latin would know. Yeah. Um, so whenever uh, some people might know, uh, it tends to get relegated a bit to history books. Uh, Savior of the Nations Come. Uh, that would be uh, written originally by Saint Ambrose. Uh, just. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me uh let me just look up the Latin again because I do not want to uh, butcher it again, uh, and I'm sure you will correct me on my pronunciation. Um, but the sort of Latin hymn that Saint Ambrose writes, uh, "Savior of the Nations, come," and I can't find actually the Latin translation now. It's uh, a Veni Redemptor uh, Genitum. So 
Genotam, um, perhaps? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I've, I've just, I'm just looking at him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so many Redemptor Gentium, I think it was. Okay, be. all right. Uh, okay, so um, you get this uh, sort of 4th century Latin hymn that makes its way into a hymn book in the year 2022, written by St. Ambrose of Milan, uh, the, you know, the very St. Ambrose that um, became the patron saint of Milan, uh, that has a, uh, I believe, the patron, patron saint also of, like, medicine or something like that. Uh, St. Uh, Ambrose. Uh... I, I, can't, I might be mixing up my saints there, but I remember he gets used for quite a lot of very well, important there's... things. There's, um, there's, uh, yes, that's right. No, no, the, the, we are talking about the same one. That's right. Yeah. He was, um, he was, trying, I, I'm going to look it up because of course there's a connection between <laughs> Ambrose, Ambrosia, I don't know. Um, yeah. so, um, but anyways, uh, this has obviously been made to, uh, fit, um, you know, English meter, at least in the modern um, version. He is but the... He is the he is the patron saint. Okay, this is this is quite yeah. extensive. He is the patron saint of the city of Milan, of beekeepers, of bakers of honey bread, of bees themselves, of bishops, of candle makers, chandlers, domestic animals, the French commissariat, geese, gingerbread makers, learning, school children, stonemasons, students, wax melters, and the city of Bologna. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so not medicine, but literally was, everything else. I was, not ex I was not expecting that. No. Uh, so, sorry, I need to. Uh... He, was, he was. He well. I, I suppose I could pun and say that he wasn't the, the patron saint of medicine, but he was a doctor of the church. Yeah. Okay. Um... Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we have that here. A, a, at least in the Roman Catholic Church, he holds those titles. Um, and most other Christian denominations, he's still considered a saint. Uh, where at least saints are. Uh, uh, you know, not seen as too Catholic, God forbid. Um, but um, just, I do not have the uh, Latin in front of me. Uh, this uh, hymn, however, uh, was at least by the Lutherans brought back into popularity by Luther. Um, Luther, on top of his, uh, you know, rabble rousing and, uh, you know, theological musings, uh, some of which I am very much partial to, uh, was also a great writer and translator of hymns. And being as Luther had the uh, background of an Augustinian monk, uh, he more than had the proficiency to translate um, music that was kept in Latin to the vulgar tongue uh, into German, which then allowed it to be translated into English, into uh, Swedish, into all these other languages. Um, so, Savior of the Nations Come uh, started Latin, 4th century, uh, might have been a chant, was put into something uh, in the vernacular, uh, by Luther, uh, sort of uh, not quite brought up to modern musical standards, Nun but still come much... to Heiden Highland. Apparently. Yeah, yep. so uh, not quite uh, not easy to sing by the modern stretch of the imagination, but uh, still much easier than a Gregorian chant or not a Gregorian chant, obviously, but a Latin chant. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the modern day, of course, you can just take that, you can fit it to a meter, uh, you can you know slightly edit the words to keep the meaning across. And then you have your modern variation. So, you know, uh, just the first couple of lines, Savior of the nations come, virgin son, make here your home. Marvel now, O heaven and earth, that the Lord chose such a birth. So, you know, that's your first uh, stanza, just sort of read out uh, uh, in its, it's poetry. It's it's interesting because it's 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 close to the meaning of the original, and it pretty much means the same thing. But it's, mm -hmm. so, it's so interesting to see how it's kind of evolved over time. So... Yeah. So, am I correct in you in your saying that the the modern Lutheran version is translated from the German that Luther took from the Latin? Now, that I I am sure that is the case with multiple other uh, Lutheran hymn books. Uh, though it is possible, given this one, that they looked into the Latin because this hymn book that I am using is the most modern one, and it was specifically made to sort of harmonize a lot of the uh, issues that everyone had with every other book that came before it. Um, and it didn't really fix half of them, but with the hymns, they did a, there's a separate book that I could get with this, perhaps if it ever goes on sale. Mm -hmm. And it's basically the size of a dictionary and it's commentary and reasoning provided for every single of like the 900 hymns in this book. That is, that is the most Protestant thing I've and, ever heard. <laughs> and I actually know someone that wrote for that, uh, who did the, uh, did the critique basically of Amazing Grace because we still have it in this book, but 
Um, it's viewed sort of as a lower hymn just because it doesn't have a, you know, it's not as deep. You know, that's mm-hmm. something that Lutherans always strive for is a, uh, you know, very deep topics, even poten- potentially when you don't need it. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, but basically, uh, it would not surprise me if they also looked at the Latin, but uh, they most likely did just translate the more Germanic version. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but I, I presume that you are looking at the Latin or the German, or is that just... I, a... Have, a, I have the original Latin and a fairly literalist translation into English. Uh, very good. So, yeah, let's compare, just on the fly. Yeah, okay. this is the cozy stream. <laughs> So, uh, so obviously in Latin you have uh, Veni redemptor gentium ostende partum virginis mireto omne saculum talis deset partus deum, which translates from the first verse as Come, thou redeemer of the earth, manifest thy virgin birth, let every age adoring fall, such birth befits the God of all. Um, yeah, so you know, much more pretty, poetic. Pretty, pretty close. Pretty close yeah, and, to what you're reading. Yeah, basically, the, I, I get the exact same meaning out of the both of them, mm-hmm. just uh, just uh, if I were to sing it. Obviously, if I were to do like a literary analysis, I might come up with a 500-page uh, you know, thesis <laughs> about why this one is obviously superior and anyone yeah. that uses the other one is a dirty <laughs> heretic. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But this is something in a hymn book. Um, and now I might make a distinction here with Psalms. Obviously, the Psalms are older, like we talked about beforehand, still in the same tradition, um, but they are not hymns. Uh, and that's a very technical category that we don't need to expound upon very much mm-hmm. uh, much more. But um, there's a difference, um, just uh, there's a technical difference in how a hymn is written. Uh, so like a, like a musical theory uh, difference between a psalm and a hymn. And the other thing, obviously, would be uh, you know, we don't quite have the music for the Psalms. Nor do we have the original language, basically the uh, you know how it would have been used. Uh, mm-hmm. So they also, aren't quite in the same category. I also have to say, lo- looking over the Latin here, which uh, I, I have been uh, over the past year, I've colossally brushed up my Latin, and I'm yeah. very very glad I have because uh, because some of this because there's 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 often this this idea in 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 literature that reading poetry and translation will never really be quite enough. That mm-hmm. there'll always be something in the original that comes across that you don't get. I mean, th- I mean, I mean, really, we need to venerate Saint Ambrose very highly because, for example, verse ver- verse five here. Um, I'll, I'll I'll read you the English first, which I mean, in the English it's pretty good, but in mm-hmm. the Latin, I'll, I'll I'll get onto that now. So the English here is, from God the Father he proceeds to God yep. the Father back he speeds his course he runs to death and hell, returning on God's throne to dwell. Now. That's pretty good, but in, I in the Latin... Like a, I do have a slightly updated version uh, that oh, might God. that might just draw it out ever so slightly. It says, God okay. the Father was his source. Back to God he ran his course. Into hell his road went down. Back then to his throne and crown. I see. So, yes. you know, it's just slightly different, but like Actually, this is... My, my, my autism is, is, is really <laughs> kicking in here for, this, for the, the differences in translation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so in the Latin... You'll notice that there's a there's there's a there's a double rhyme at the beginning and end of each line here. So it goes, mm-hmm. "Egressus edus a patre, regressus edus ad patrem, excursus usque ad infernos, recursus ad sedem dei." And so again, you not only have the the quite kind like the 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 wordplay almost in the in in in, in the in the Latin is, is 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 incredible, but also just because the again the the first word of each line rings off the neck so you've got aggressus regressus excursus recursus you know it 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 clearly saint ambrose was one of the great poets of our time well not of our time well of, of humanity i suppose right yeah i mean um, if you're a christian you can very feasibly say our time <laughs> yes yeah, so this is that's what i thought yeah obviously um but yes um just the you know incredible poetic still be, be, being employed back then um, right yeah and so like that's the fourth century um, and basically, ever since we have hymns going all through, and if you were to accept that thing in Scripture uh, that we showed at the beginning, uh, First Co- or Colossians chapter one, rather, um, you know, we even had hymns basically as soon as Christ ascended. <laughs> so, yes. um, uh, or at least uh, you know, popular music that was meant to extol the uh, the you know awesomeness of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, so, 
that's basically sort of like the introduction just to show like the heritage and the historiosity behind all this uh, hat. And, you know, I've, uh, I've done a lot of uh, sort of directing at the beginning of this, but you know, what would you uh, like, uh, what hymn would you like to go over? Well, before I pick a specific hymn, I want to just address um, something related to hymns and kind of Britain, I suppose. Um, because so in as far as i'm aware pretty much every british primary school unless it's an explicitly secular one will do some form of christian worship um i believe by law um mm. so there'll be some kind of hymn singing there'll be prayer etc um or at least that's how it was you know um back when i was in school i i it, it does occasionally come up as like a political issue like prayer in schools i think just just like you have but Right. Um, but generally, I believe all, all primary schools uh, still do it. And because the Church of England is the Church of England, not only do you occasionally sing sort of the nice traditional hymns, you also get um, what you might call sort of children's hymns. Um, now, right. some, some of these are particularly, particularly good. Um, in fact, I will read one for you that was that was one of my favorites at school. And um, I have to say, obviously, as somebody who then became a poet, um these did have an enormous influence on me do you have uh, a uh, name just so i can uh yes this is me. called uh, let me go through my, my <laughs> tabs i've got open here so it's called when a knight won his spurs and it's a ch it's a children's hymn by uh, jan struther um and it was it was actually harmonized by um um vaughan williams okay. uh, yeah yeah of course pu published in 1931 i think um and it became very, very popular as a, as, as a children's hymn. And it's only short, so I'll, I'll read it as a poem because I can't sing. Um, and it, it goes like this. It goes, when a knight won his spurs in the stories of old, he was gentle and brave. He was gallant and bold. With a shield on his arm and a lance in his hand, for God and for valor, he rode through the land. No charger have I and no sword by my side, yet still to adventure and battle I ride. Though back into storyland giants have fled, and the knights are no more, and the dragons are dead. Let faith be my shield, and let joy be my steed, against the dragons of anger, the ogres of greed. And let me set free with the sword of my youth, from the castle of darkness, the power of truth. Yeah, I have I have never seen a, uh, you know, anything hymnical use ogre like yeah. as a word so that's very well, cool it's it's kind of a it's it's like a it's, it's quite a chestertonian thing isn't it you know the, the, yeah, yeah. The, the dragons and knights and faith i mean it is it is uh i have to say even as somebody who was very sort of ambivalent about religion as a child that was you know quite a powerful thing to sing um you know i mean I think that Christians could do a lot of good by uh, going to their Christian youth and yes. sort of like uh, telling them the great stories and histories of like the medieval knights and crusaders and all of that, rather than mm -hmm. the uh, uh, whatever like you know, pop issue it is right now about like we're sending Definitely. this many Definitely. billion dollars to Africa. You know, this I is mean, we all we also used to sing these like these <laughs> these quite quite terrible um, like uh quote ch ch children's hymns like uh I, I i think these are like inspired by like american like like ch children's church songs as well but we used to have these ones that were like it was something like about how god made all creation and it was like from the tiny ant to the tiny ant to the elephant <laughs> to the, yeah like these really kind of uh, yeah, yeah. Upbeat, upbeat. i don't know i don't know if, if you had stuff like that as well we had uh... Let me see. So uh, this is from uh, this is going to be hilarious, being the controversy that we had with a uh, academic agent over the issue. Um, but the Lutherans will point back to the patriarchs of the Old Testament as the as the, you know the older Christians. Uh, right. So one of the uh, obviously one of the things that we would learn from a young age. I don't know if it counts as hymns, uh, but certainly within the vein of like children's Christian music uh, would be Father Abraham. Right. Uh, you know, Father Abraham has many sons and many sons as Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. Uh, and then it's like, so let's all praise the Lord or something like that. So, um, yeah, that was what I was raised on, uh, along with other hymns as well. Like we have, uh, certainly with hymns, you have some that get much more theological and much more in depth. Um, and then you have other ones that are much more basic and <clears throat> basically just sing you the story of something from the, uh, from yeah. the scriptures, uh, but with just a little bit more detail added onto it. Um, so, uh, we three Kings, 
uh, might be a uh, slightly famous one potentially to uh, at least some of the Americans. Um, basically, and it's talk, it talks about the uh, three wise men that come to visit Christ uh, on the uh, night of his birth. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing, like, obviously, it's a gift giving to Christ, a very, uh, very rich gift. Uh, so you get that sort of moral thing there, you know, you know give to God. Um, yeah. But it's not really in depth. You know, it doesn't tell you, like, Christ saves you or anything like that necessarily. Yeah. Um, and it just but basically it tells you about the hardships of the uh, Magi and all this other stuff. Um, mm-hmm. that, that was uh, that, that's sort of like the uh, probably would be on the younger end. That's something that you would uh, if you have that in the hymnal, something that you would probably have the youth sing more than the uh, the adults. Yes. Uh, not exclusive and nothing's written that says you have to do that. Uh, but it's a good way to uh, teach them, you know, the story of scripture. You know, the three Magi, mm-hmm. um, you know, brought frankincense and myrrh and gold. Well, I have to. I have to say, because yeah. you mentioned that, I, I, I think maybe it was because, unfortunately, the, 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 the Church of England is is terrified of being Christian. Um, <laughs> but uh, a lot of the hymns that we sang were quite devoid of like scriptural reference. It was all oh. very kind of. It, they, they, they were kind of like pains to, like thank God, but it was very general. Of also because of course, like you know, in Britain now, like half the kids are going to be like Indian <laughs> and like Arab, so. Yeah, you know, I, they so and of course they're, they're they're so cringingly terrified of offending anybody that they like tone down the Christianity. Unfortunately, um, I mean, so there's there's one hymn I want to talk to you about right now. This is this is yeah. kind of a, this is a, this is a weird one, right? And it well, it's called it's called Autumn Days, and apparently it was written by um, like a, somebody in the 1960s or late 60s. Oh, say early, that name again. Early 70s. Autumn Days is the name, oh, okay. of, the name of it, um, and I just want to. So there's, it's so it's it's quite pleasant, sort of like sort of quite simple song about like nice things in the world, and the chorus is like, so I mustn't forget to say a great big thank you, basically to to, to God. God isn't mentioned, but it's a Christian hymn, so it's it's somewhat implicit, um, and uh, there's it's all these there's all these references to it. So it says like. Uh, Clouds that look like a familiar face and the winter's moon with frosted rings. Smell of bacon as I fasten up my laces and the song the milkman sings, right? Um, yeah. And then there's just this one line, right? Now I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna read, you the, read you the verse it's in and see if you can spot that's quite odd line in the hymn. Autumn days when the grass is jeweled and the silk inside a chestnut shell. Jet planes meeting in the air to be refueled. All these things I love so well. <laughs> you see, do you see this, the slightly odd line there? Yeah, I do. Hold on, let yeah. me uh, let me pull. Let, I've got this is uh, just the way it's written or uh, laid out from what I'm yeah, drawing from. I'm mean, gonna have to have two screenshots. Aren't, aren't laid out very well. So, um, um, let me just throw this up on screen, and it's uh, definitely much. You can tell it's much more modern just in its structure. Yeah, which, it is. Uh, hold on. Um, this no, that's the chorus. Hold on, one moment. Uh, but yeah, continue, and I will uh, throw that up. Well, so this line about jet planes meeting in the air to be refueled, it used to yeah. like it used to sort of st- stick in my head as a slightly odd line in a yeah. hymn. Like, I, I didn't really get why you'd be thankful for jet planes because planes that refuel each other in the air are it's not like an airliner. That's what like military like spy planes do, right? Like the mm-hmm. ones that like the like the those American planes that like never stop flying they just keep going, oh, yeah. like that kind of thing so i looked into it like a few years after i was singing it in primary school and apparently the author was like some kind of cold warrior who was like <laughs> who was like big on like fighting the soviets and included that line because he thought that we should be thankful for like you know our, our boy is going to, to fight the communists, I guess. I, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's you know, just, that, that seems very boomerish, but that is much better is. than a, you know, pink. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose <laughs> so. um, um, but it, it just, it just strikes me as a curious line, you know, in a, in a hymn to be thankful for jet planes. I mean, if you want a good Christian military hymn, then it has to be either onward Christian soldiers or I don't, I don't know if this is a hymn, but obviously, <laughs> uh, uh, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. It's pretty fun. I mean, uh, so um, the Lutherans will lay, I and I remember the Baptists did this as well. I don't know if it's a universal though, so I'm just going to speak for those two. They will lay out their hymns by uh, category, by topic. Yeah. 
And one of the topics in the Lutheran hymn is the church militant, which is literally right. all of the war hymns. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and include such famous hymns as a mighty fortress. Yeah. Right. So, yes. Uh, uh, it, but uh, before we move on to that, just because, you know, you're, uh, I want to say you've like thrown a curveball at me because it's not like this is bad, but like, uh, you know, I want to work with something I've never seen before. And it's definitely not in my, you know, usual sphere. So we'll just throw out the chorus here, which I've, uh, um, especially the, uh, the last three lines as well. Um, I can imagine as a child, um, you know, perhaps as you start off might seem very nice. And then yeah. as you like go a couple of years will seem very sort of, uh, you know, non not needed or sort of childish you know because you get childs that don't want to be treated as a child don't want to be condescended to mm -hmm. and then as you grow older you sort of you start to realize the uh you know the sort of depth that it is to say thank you to god yes. you know to, to thank god for the blessings that you receive whatever also, they may I be i also like that this this version has the uh breath annotation <laughs> still in <Yeah>. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um i mean so with the older hymns, you know, it's sort of just implied that the organist, or if you're doing it a cappella, the singers, or if you have instruments, to the uh, musicians, will just sort of know where to leave breaths for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually spelling it out might help some people just from experience. Well, I mean, it, if, uh, it, if, if it's like a, a hall full of like school age kids, then you know, maybe, may, may, maybe. But it, it, it's not. It's not like it's really like rocket science to figure out where. You yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be intuitive, yeah. and, and that might be the other thing that we forgot to, or that I at least forgot to mention at the beginning, is all this is the hymns are meant to be sung by basically everyone. Yes. So you have to be intuitive. You have to put things into language that people will understand without sort of losing the meaning, um, and you know you have to uh, make it memorable. So this is just to jump back to what we were using earlier, the Saint Ambrose hymn. Uh, it gets everything across. It uses plain language of course it's uh, fancy uh, in the way it's laid out it's poetic mm -hmm. but that's to be expected um and you know anyone can sing that and basically come away with at least more of an understanding of the uh you know of the very sort of a uh, miraculous nature of christ's birth mm -hmm. yes um though i would have to criticize this for just being a bit too like absent of oh yeah like, christianity in general <laughs> i mean so <laughs> there uh Amazing Grace <clears throat> is very obviously in sort of like the uh, popular uh, culture, mm -hmm. just as like the Christian hymn to play at uh, yes. at funerals or at, uh, at any event where you just sort of are in awe of God. Mm -hmm. um, now, <clears throat> theologians will critique Amazing Grace because they never really say whose grace, you know, they, you know, they never it, say it Christ. Feels, it, or... it feels slightly craven because, I mean... It was written by somebody who had had like a very hard fought conversion back to Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so... yeah specifically, a uh, I believe it would be a slave trader that uh, became horrified with the uh, yeah that's happening. Right. There. So um, yeah, sorry, I sent you uh, what I was going to bring up. But next, I mean, but... at least at least Amazing Grace has like mentions of God and you know yes, yes. Being saved and etc. I mean that 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 other children's hymn I showed you that was literally just talking about like boots and, and bacon yeah, yeah. and planes. I mean, it's and, like, <laughs> in fairness, in this you know, fancy hymnal that I've been hyping up so much, it has fourth century hymns. We have uh, you know some pretty, what I would consider just be relatively bad hymns in there. Mm -hmm. uh, just, yeah, you know, um, it is very easy, and uh, especially uh, some of the more poetic minds among us, especially Panama Hat, might see it's very easy to just list and describe things. Uh, and you know, at the end, just put you know, so be thankful. Yeah, you know, that seems much more easier than trying to fit like a theological truth mm -hmm. into music that people can understand in meter. Yes. You know, so um, you you do get that element there. Um, so now the other thing that I would the thing that I was going to like to show if we're gonna the uh, Savior of the Nations come was an Advent hymn. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a very other famous Advent hymn or carol. Um, and that would be O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, probably doesn't come across well on here. Um, but, you know, that's the page that we have in the Lutheran hymnal. Mm -hmm. And you might notice something over there to the right. This, uh, you know, we get the carol over here in the, very, in the seven or so verses off to yes. the right whenever you run out of room. And then you get antiphons, mm -hmm. which sound very Catholic, very cathedral-like. Very, very, yes. Uh, so what's going on there? Well, 
uh, first is just talk about the uh, talk about the the carol or the hymn itself, uh, depending on how you know this. Um, there's also the uh, sort of Latin uh, translation of this that is also popular. Uh, do you know it, Pat? Uh, of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Yeah, Veni, Veni, Emmanuel. Yes, yes, yeah. we used to sing it. And we also, but the thing is, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel was one of my favorite, favorite things because we would sing it at mm -hmm. Christmas. And it was one of the ones they would, you know, we used to do it in um, a, a church called, uh, some, it was called, well, called St. Mary's. I don't know how many churches are called St. Mary's, right? But, that, that's but the one this, in my local town. It's called exactly, St. Mary's. Exactly, right? But it, it had, well, it's literally, I think every town I've lived in has a St. Mary's. But, um, you know, gigantic organ for such, for a relatively small provincial church. Um, and uh, they obviously, we, we the school had a brass band we would bring in. And, um, you know, this was one of the ones where they really did, they did all the works for it. I mean, there, there are some powerful sounding lines in this. Um, I, I've always remembered that line about about ransom captive Israel. And I remember as a kid, yeah. not particularly familiar with scripture, um, trying to f trying to work out what exactly that meant. And I, I always, I, I'm, I'm not joking. I, I assumed as a kid that Israel was somebody who had been like held captive by bad guys, and Emmanuel had to come and save him. Um, you know, well, like sort of a <laughs> metaphorically that's I mean, entirely metaphorically, correct it is yeah i mean it's probably, <laughs> it was probably a little bit too mission impossible to be scripturally relevant in my in my eight-year-old brain but you know it was still right. still 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 oh, i've always loved it as a song and then of course when i became more more literate in general i i appreciated the the real meaning of it all right and yeah you know, if you have uh, definitely if you're raised much more strictly religious which uh, neither you or i uh, just judging by how we thought of these things when we were younger probably have that experience mm -hmm. um you know this uh this will stick with you throughout your entire life and this can be said because i know people that have gone through that and you and i who came to this stuff late by comparison mm -hmm. that sticks with us too oh yeah, yeah. We don't I mean, have sort of like the childlike impressionability or the uh, uh, naivety that comes with, you know, you know, you go throughout your entire like childhood days and then suddenly you have a mm -hmm. hymn thrown in front of you that says to ransom a captive. Yes. Uh, you know, that, that's going to stick with you. And it mm -hmm. does with us, even in our sort of a uh, desensitized, uh, you know, uh, rank punditry addled brains. Yes. Um, <laughs> am I am I confusing hymns here? Or because I believe, unless I'm confusing it with a different hymn, I believe there was a line in the one we used to sing mm -hmm. that mentioned, um, "Oh, come, come, thou rod of Jesse." Ah, um, yeah. So if is, we uh, is that uh, in, is that in this version or? So if we look at a uh, four here, it's going to be slightly differently translated. Oh, and O oh, come, thou branch of Jesse's tree, free oh, them from Jesse's tyranny. Yes, tyranny. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So for us, it was O oh, come, thou thou rod of jesse free freedom from satan's tyranny or some something yeah, like yeah. That. yeah so um and this is a uh, the refrain is uh meant to be much more uh chorale like than some of the mm -hmm. other hymns because typically when people think of hymns especially if they're americans uh they get bored with them because you just sing all the way through it and that's the melody is just what you sing there's no like refrain mm -hmm. or chorus yes even though a lot of these uh very famous uh especially the christmas hymns and carols will have a refrain Yes. You know, the, uh, this one will have rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. so, See, that's that's where the organ would be doing that on full blast, and then the brass right. band would do a counter melody while that was going. It was right. like one of the most incredible things. Or yeah, and you can do a lot of things with that just because there's yeah. a. For what uh, you know, you can think about this paradoxically or logically. Uh, I've had people that have been either confused by it or may thinks it make perfect makes perfect sense. Um, if you have a very simple musical tune, it is much easier to very uh, to have variations on it. It is much easier to add complexity to it than something that's already complex. So yes. yeah, so that's usually stumps some people. But um, it's incredible. So. I I miss just belting out those hymns every yeah. year. It's such, so, such a great great time. Just, you know, I mean. Probably experiences like like that just prepared me more than pretty much anything else to just you know fully enter uh, the church. I think just because you know just you know how how can you give up some, some, something like that? Just 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 the the the, the words and the music. Um, you know, there's a there's a hymn that I we we actually sang it in uh, in mass a few weeks ago. Um, oh God, I, sh I should I should know what it's called, but it's always the one line that sticks in my head. Uh, I won't. I won't tangent on this too long. Um, 
Uh, it's so it's so the hymn is "Angel Voices Ever Singing," um, which is a very another popular sort of another popular Ang Anglican one. Um, and it's so angel voices ever singing round by throne of light, angel harps forever singing rest not day or night. And then in the third verse, there's this fantastic line, which is um, the se second to last. Well, I'll, I'll read the whole stanza. It's, yea, we know thy love rejoices o'er each work of thine. Thou didst ears and hands and voices for thy praise combine. Craftsman's art and music's measure for thy pleasure didst design. That cra craftsman's art and music's measure. It's such a, a syllabically rich line there. I mean, yeah, I remember, I remember as a kid hearing that and just like, I mean, I, you know, I, I always credit um, Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade for getting me into poetry, but I often don't give enough praise to that line as well, because that honestly did have a huge influence because I just remember hearing it every time we sang it and going, that's just a good string of words right there. You know, that's just satisfying. There's something good about that. Right, yeah. Um, and just because of the way that I am, um, I tend to find it much easier to, um, you know, make lyrics that sound much more modern as opposed to uh, the sort of, uh, you know, timeless, uh, you know, poetic works that we are going over and extolling here. Uh, so all of this stuff, it, it amazes me on a musical level just because I cannot make something like this. Uh, you right. know, this is, uh, this is out of my capability. So I just have to like look on in awe and appreciate the, you know, the fact that I well, have it. Well, the, 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 thing, the thing is though, those, those hymn writers in the, in say the 1600s, they weren't writing in like an archaic style. They, they were right. writing in what was vernacular for them. Right. Um, yes. So I believe we should pretty much do the same unless, because, you know, I've warned, I've warned many young poets, especially who are kind of of a, of a kind of right wing persuasion, that they shouldn't just try and do museum pieces. You know, don't don't ape um, historical language for no reason. Because right. It'll just it'll just come off as very cliche, and you ought to be moving forward, not looking backwards. I think. Um, right, yeah. You know, just just always always remember that. You know, none of none of these hymns, as far as I'm aware, were written by somebody who was trying to ape a particular style of language. They were writing in what and how and basically the way they spoke um and that's yeah. that's true of poetry as well pretty much and and yeah just to clarify that's not saying you know it's you know, for uh forego the past basically but no Bill don't, don't forego something... yeah, exactly exactly yeah. because you know if if you know w william blake could still have been william blake if he had lived 200 years later or 200 years prior you know mm -hmm. um it, 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 it's it's not the particular kind of idiosyncrasies of the language of his time that make his poetry great. You know, it's the right. it's just his po sheer poetic ability. You know, and you know, I'm not saying write in Zuma speak, obviously, but just <laughs> you know, use use language in a way that's not reliant on archaicisms and kind of faux historical language. Because also the the the, the reality is that you'll probably get it wrong. You you probably won't be able to, you won't be able to accurately recreate that language. It takes a lot of work and and study and and luck as well to try and do an ac a sort of accurate piece of uh, of historical homage. But anyway, I think I think we're getting uh, a bit distracted here. Right, and uh, just to go back to this, you mentioned that uh, so rejoice, rejoice the uh, mm -hmm. the uh, refrain that everyone sh hopefully everyone knows. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the things you do is you have the organ playing a giant chord as yes. loud as possible <laughs> on the first one. And then the brass Yeah, and then the brass echo it in the next one. So you get one very loud organistic rejoice. And then the brass echo rejoice. Um and then you know things kind of go back to normal. The other thing that you can do is um if you say have like the uh organ and the uh brass or just even the uh people singing in unison or you know uh, in in parallel basically yeah. um you can have the first one be very loud rejoice and then at the mm -hmm. next one very quiet rejoice and then you sort of sing the rest of the refrain, refrain very sort of quietly yeah. and solemnly um and you have to keep in mind this is an advent hymn uh the happy ending of christ coming does not come in this hymn <laughs> so uh you you know the the very last verse that most people will be familiar with O come, desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad division cease, and be thyself our thyself our king of peace. You mm -hmm. know that's the uh, you know that's the end of the uh, story being told yes. here. 
So, uh, as with all Advent hymns, you're always uh, awaiting the coming of Christ, uh, but you only mm -hmm. get Christ on Christmas, yes, which exactly. is why which is why this is properly speaking an Advent hymn and not a Christmas hymn, even though we mm. sing it at Christmas. Because yes. at Christmas, you can sing this, and it has a totally different meaning. You know, you're looking back at the uh, desires for Christ after already having received him. Yes. But when you All sing right. this in Advent, it's very much a longing that you can hear in the diction mm. of like the of the hymn itself. And it, it is odd, because, of course, to me, this will always be, like, one of the greatest Christmas hymns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to me, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? This is entirely a, a field of autism. I'm not going to tell people, don't sing Go Come, O Come, Emmanuel at Christmas. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, like, hopefully for people that can see this, hopefully you can appreciate the difference that it has when you sing it at different times. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, over here we have the antiphons that I joked about being Catholic earlier. Uh, these are much more beseeching than the actual verses. And mm -hmm. uh, my church uh, has the pop era, basically we're over 100 people or so, and we have, like, the... Uh, the wealth and population to where we could assemble like a choir from the people in the church to actually sing these with the yes. organ, uh, which if you're in some rural areas, that's just not an option because you've only no. got like 30 people or so. And then you don't necessarily have that much money or time to throw into uh, no. arranging a choir. Um, but I remember on uh, December the uh, 19, uh, the 19th that you can see down here uh, right here, I did, mm -hmm. I did get to sing this with the choir, and it's much more chanted. Uh, it's right. much older in, in its uh, in sounding. So, uh, but basically, um, this would correspond to the uh, the verse about you know, Jesse. Because yes. it's December 19, O root of Jesse's tree, standing as an ensign before the peoples, before whom all kings are mute, to whom the nations will do homage, come quickly to deliver us. Verse 4, O come thou branch of Jesse's tree, Free them from Satan's tyranny, that trust thy mighty power to save. Uh, yeah, that trust thy mighty power to save and give them victory over the grave. And then you go back to the hymn. So it's basically each of these mm -hmm. antiphons kind of correspond to the same verse because all of these ultimately have the same inspiration in Scripture. So right. Um, yeah. Uh, obviously, this isn't uh, universal to all churches. This is just a uh, uh, much in the same way as the children's hymn that you showed up. This is a. Uh, this is yeah something that's a bit unique, if you will, mm -hmm. okay. um, to a specific group of people. But it's uh whenever it's Advent, uh you know right before Christmas, it's cold outside. Um, you have sort of like a, a dimly lit sanctuary, just because that's how most American churches are. Uh, sort of keeping with tradition of uh you know lighting not being the main concern, but you know mm -hmm. rather the structure of the church itself. You know where yes, do you definitely. put the altar, the font. Um, you know. Whenever you hear the choir or sing in the choir, one of these antiphons, after the congregation sings one of these verses, uh, it's haunting almost, you know, sort of like, a, yeah, you, it will, uh, if you have a more musical side or a side more appreciative of us, of uh, the spirituality of all of this, uh, to use a terribly abused word, um, you start to realize just how much you do need Christ. <laughs> Yes, essentially. <laughs> like, like all all of the words written on this paper is a very elaborate way of someone expressing and getting others to express with them the fact that they need Christ. Um, and not only that they need Christ, but very direly need Christ. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the beauty of all of this. Uh, you know, that's yeah. summarizing it almost vulgarly. Um, but uh, that that is the whole point of this. So, uh, Mr. Hat, uh, if you don't have anything to add there, by all means, if you do, uh, um, well, I just want to briefly touch on, uh, of course, um, at Christmas time, we mm -hmm. would also, you know, Okama Kama Emmanuel, as you, you, you mentioned the, 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 the Latin yes. uh, version of that, which we, which we would sometimes do, but we would always do um, <clears throat> O Come All Ye Faithful. Mm, um, yes. And we would do that in, in the Latin. Now, O Come All Ye Faithful, um, I believe is actually, it was originally in Latin. The English yeah. is uh, in, in vulgar. Um, yeah, that one. <clears throat> and that's yeah. why I don't sing these things. Um, <laughs> so, yes, it was, um, It's it's been attributed to several different people. The authorship is actually uh, not certain. One of the authors may have even been uh, King John IV of Portugal. Um, yeah, I, I remember hearing that. And that yeah. 
Uh, not because, like, your status in life makes what you write inherently better, nope. but the fact that you, like, can you imagine a head of state or government today writing a, you know, timeless hymn for Christmas? Yeah, exactly. there's something there's something awesome about that. There is, there is, you know, a true, a true, a, 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 what, what was it? I think they, the, the newspapers here used to call General Franco um, a Christian gentleman. Um, yeah. I think that you could, you could say the same thing about somebody like King John of Portugal, you know. Um, Yes, indeed. Uh, well, I mean, you know, better times, I think. <laughs> Be better times, yes. It's it's also been uh, attributed to anonymous um, Cistercian monks. My feeling is that's probably where the tune originally comes from. Like, it that was probably sense. some monks that were chanting it and the tune came, came into the vernacular. Um, the version we know now is by uh, um, uh, uh, an English Catholic called Frederick Oakley. Um, who converted to Catholicism from the Church of England in the 1850s. So probably one of Newman's. Um, right. Or is that slightly before Newman? I'm not sure. Certainly in the lifetime of Newman. So so probably related to him some way. Um, but yes, and it was written, I believe, slightly before his conversion. Um, but uh, but yes, so obviously, O oh, come, all, 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 ye, all ye faithful. Um Joyful and triumphant, of course. You know the the, the basically is singing about the, the the birth of Christ. Yeah, um, I mean, and and so hopefully, uh, you know, oh come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Uh, hopefully, people can sort of get the, uh, or at least uh, perceive the difference there uh, from what you would hear in a Christmas hymn from an Advent hymn, because I don't want that to just fly by as some sort of autistic uh, no, technicality. It's, it is, it's important because you know in the Advent hymn it is very much needy. You know, and it is very much sort of like falling at the feet of God asking for a savior. Yes. And then when you get to Christmas, everyone is triumphant and joyful because now you have the savior. You have a reason to be very much happy, rejoicing and joyful. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, um, there, there is a difference there that is uh, you can even see it in the very tone of the hymn. But anyways, I, yeah. I've also I've also heard it said there's a theory among certain musical academics that it's actually a secret Jacobite song. It's like a oh. crypto Jacobite <laughs> song. Um, because the person who published it, John Francis Wade, um, he published it originally in 1751. And it's considered, and he thought he may have been not talking not so much about Christ, but about Bonnie Prince Charlie, um, the Jacobite pretender. <laughs> um, and, that uh, is quite the theory. No, but there's, there's, there's some more deep laws to this because it's yeah, said. Yeah. It said that that the faithful is a political code which is decipherable to referring to the Jacobite masses, and Bethlehem was apparently a common cipher used for England. Okay, and, right. And it said, and of course, the line "Regem Angelorum" is thought to be a Latin pun on "Angelorum," which means angels, and mm -hmm. "Anglorum," which means the English. So. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. I'm just trying to find the. Uh... It's, it's possible. So, that's that's insane. I've never heard that. And now that you're yep. saying it, like the the Latin lines up. Now, the only issue I would have, and this might just be showing my ignorance on the topic, isn't um, isn't England supposed to be uh, Jerusalem? Um. Or is well, that heard, a modern I've, invention? I've heard that too. Um. Well, of course, the un, un, unless you're thinking of the William Blake poem Jerusalem, that became I'm more him. just I'm more just assuming that he didn't write that in a vacuum. Um, um well, apparently, well, apparently the Jacobites specifically used the cipher Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Okay. to refer to England um, when they were speaking. Um, and of course, we, we are going to have to talk about William Blake's Jerusalem. Um, we, we we were discussing this before. We may end up just doing a part two. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many so many good hymns and, and bits of trivia to cover. So if we don't, so the, I I think that either way, today is not the last we have to say on hymns. Oh, most definitely. And I, the um, fact that we've sort of uh, kept this sort of like at the beginning to the general overview and the children's hymns, and now Advent and Christmas. You know, yes. it leaves the rest of the church year and the other topics to discuss at a later date, which uh, works well. But uh, just to uh, uh, provide a visualization of everything you were saying there, I have the uh, English and just because of the state of my synod, a Spanish translation that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, this is the O Come All Ye Faithful. Um, so, 
at the beginning it's have you know, O come all ye faithful, which is the translation, it's a death day fidelis. Mm -hmm. Yes, a death day fidelis, light eyed triumphantes. Um, so I also now want to move quickly on to, I, I, ha I have to do this because yeah. it's compulsory, which is the, uh, the, uh, the great Welsh hymn. Um, uh, well, the, the, the tune is actually called um, Cum, Cum Ronda. Okay. Um, but it's better known in English as Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer, um, which I'm and, guessing yeah. that you know. I mean, yes. it's quite, quite a popular one. Um, it's from an old Welsh folk tune. Um, and of course it has the, so it's guide me, oh, thou great redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, mm -hmm. but thou art mm -hmm. mighty. Yeah, I have played people. this theme so many times. And then of course, whenever we're at a, whenever, wherever we're at a, a rugby match, we get the bread of heaven, bread <laughs> of heaven, beat me till I want no more. You know, it's always fun to see that. That's, that's, that's just, that's just become an anthem of, of Welsh rugby fans. I don't know. Uh, why, yeah. So good. yeah. In our private discussions, every single time you tell me about like the rugby matches and the football chance and all this other stuff, oh, like I don't oh. know why it's just hilarious. I actually forgot you're gonna love this. I forgot. You know the um, Autumn Days song. Uh, yes. Uh, Autumn Day, there, there's a line in that, right? I don't know if you can flick back to it quickly just to illustrate this. Um, sorry, I'm getting you to go through the visuals like far too quick. <laughs> um, but uh, if we go back to that, because there's a line um, in it. Yeah, hold yeah, on. Let me, let me pull that up real quick. Another, again, another but... line, yeah. Uh, would this be the chorus or the... Uh... Uh, it's towards the end. It's the... Oh, I don't... Have I closed it now? It's it's the... Uh... No, no, no. It's to... I think it's the one about the engine. Um... Hmm. That might be one that I don't have. Oh, no, I see it. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. I see it. Hold on. Well... Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it, but there's there's a line in there, which basically is uh, I'll, I'll I'll wait till it comes up on the stream. Go. I think Turnip will know, but it's yeah. So you got this um the, the scent of gardens when the rain's been falling and a minnow darting down a stream, picked up engine that's been stuttering and stalling and a win for my home team. Now, <laughs> whenever this was sung, right, you got to imagine this this lovely you know hall full of like English Welsh school children, you know. Singing and the minnow darting down a stream, and then it would get to that line, that last line, and everyone would just go completely North FC. It would just be picked up engine that's been stuttering and stalling. I had a word for my home team. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, you know. Everyone and it would get into trouble because there would be there would be you know fists in the air and feet stamping on the ground. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and a lot of these hymns do have um, do have quite strong ties to sports as well. Um, they've become kind of anthems. Um, right. I mean, that line about how that uh, um, guide me, oh thou great redeemer, how it's sung at it's sung at rugby matches. Well, um, of course, I don't know if you know this, but here in the UK, lots of sports teams, not so much in Wales, but um, in in Northern England and in Scotland especially, were founded um, based on religious affiliation. Um, so mm -hmm. there, there would be teams for Catholics and teams for, for Protestants. Um, and, uh, there was actually, um, up in Scotland, there, there are these two teams. Uh, one is called Celtic and one is called Rangers. I believe, um, Celtic is Catholic and Rangers is Protestant. And in the seventies here and the sixties as well, um, these two teams when playing would cause like citywide riots basically over, <laughs> over the sectarian split. I mean, to the point where like people would die every time that these two teams played because the fans really? get that out. I mean, it was bad. It was bad. There's a there's there, there's a newspaper um, cartoon I remember seeing as a kid where there's this guy who has covered himself in like a dust bin as like armor. And he's got the, the bin lid on his head and he's carrying a club and he's walking off down the street and his wife is quite forlornly looking at him go through the window. And she said, I could just about manage when he went off to the war but when he went to see Rangers versus Celtic, I don't know what I would do <laughs> you know? because it was, it was, it was considered to be that violent. And um, yeah. uh, I was actually being told, told by somebody the other day that um, in Italy, for, for example, um, the, the tunnel that the football players come through to come out onto the pitch for a match actually has um, Catholic chapels in it. Mm -hmm. um, so that the, so that prayers, uh, the players will go and uh, pray and maybe even receive a quick mass, um, 
before before the match uh, as blessing um because football is taken very seriously in, yeah. in many catholic countries um i mean that's i kind of like that um yes yeah, it's pretty good like, isn't it you could see an argument that that devalues it but they're quite the opposite here i think they are giving people mass no. the uh fear well, that this, they might die well no but this is the thing <laughs> i mean i mean you have to remember that a, a, like a lot of these football players in countries like in south america and in spain and in italy they do come from very humble backgrounds and mm -hmm. often very, very religious backgrounds. And so that that kind of that quick that quick mass or that quick blessing and that quick prayer before a match, like that's one of like it's one of the most sort of devotional things they can do, you know, because they really do oh, yeah. earnestly believe in it. You know, it's inc it's an incredibly quick thing. I mean, you know, it's like how um the the Carlist uh militia, the the Requetes, um when they were going into battle in in the Spanish civil war, they would receive they would have a mass before they went into an attack always. Mm -hmm. And the Republican troops uh, in their in their memoirs would often report that the one thing they feared the most, more than the more than the more than the bombs and the bullets and the shells and the tanks, it was facing a battalion of of of, of Requetes right after they'd received communion because of course they've just received communion mm -hmm. so they're going into battle with the knowledge that if they are shot they will go to heaven yeah they literally have nothing to lose and only to, to gain they have nothing to lose and i mean it's it's pretty hard to sin in like the 10 minutes before you know you pick up your <laughs> rifle and, and, and run into the battle so, you know like they're i think they're pretty safe either way but yes it was it was said that they had that that holy fury you know they were they were basically unstoppable once they got, got into the fight in that respect yeah. Um, so I mean, you know, these these kind of these these moments and things—they they are very powerful. We are getting a bit distracted from him. Well, no, no. I I was just going to say, uh, of course, I like talking about the Carlists, especially before the Spanish Civil War mm -hmm. um, and the Carlist Wars, just because you had um, volunteer legions from Protestants yes, the, that went the, to the fight. Lutheran uh, volunteers. Yeah, Lutherans and Calvinists uh, both went to uh, fight for the Carlists, just because they saw the Carlists as the legi the legitimate authority of God in Spain. Uh, the bulwark uh, the, against liberalism. The uh, the legitimate appointed authority of God in Spain, rather, yeah, and and of course you had all the practical the uh, things like that, but they saw them as legitimate, yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, you kind of good. had a, a cross denominational uh, no, no yeah. more brother wars. We have to <laughs> we have to stand together in the yeah. battle against modernity. Now, if I could stop getting ever so angry at uh, trads that continue to uh, annoy <laughs> me, I will. Uh, yeah. yeah, this this is join, the uh, join together. Yeah, this is the winning political formula, but uh, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, th this is a. Uh, I've played this many times. Uh, so, um, at my local church, uh, I would and still do assemble a brass quartet or more. Uh, I remember from my pastor's ordination, I got, I think, 15 people to play for it uh, mm -hmm. outside of like the organ and the choir and the bells. So, um, but like, uh, and this is like a small town of like, uh, you know, 20,000 people having like a 15 person live, uh, you know, basically symphonic orchestra playing for an yes. ordination is pretty. Uh, the hard to organize. Pretty amazing, though. Um, uh, but then, like for Christmas, all of the Christmas hymns and Advent hymns that we just went through, I basically either had a string trio or a uh, sort of like a small ensemble of woodwinds and brass play for that, and that, that's been the tradition now for a few years. Is uh, you know, we basically get the uh, musicians in town, uh, we give them sheet mm -hmm. music, and we just uh, we have a, a German Christmas market, and throughout the entire thing, we just play those hymns, and mm -hmm. uh, so you know. This one I have played in church, the one that we have up on screen here. It's not Christmas and all that. That was all an aside. But, um, you know, this theme gets used uh, in various different hymns and not just this one. So mm -hmm. I have played this theme and I could probably, if I brought my trumpet out, which I'm not going to do for the sake of the ears of the audience, uh, you know, just with how loud it would be. Um, <laughs> doesn't, you know, I, could... doesn't, I don't think um, StreamYards quite has the capacity. It doesn't, <laughs> um, doesn't, have, quite, doesn't have quite the recording uh, strength, I don't think. <laughs> Right. And so, uh, you know, I probably remember the uh, the melody for this on the trumpet. So um, mm -hmm. it's a very it's a very beautiful hymn. Um, now, the other uh, thing that I was going to bring up, if you didn't mind, uh, was we talked about we're, if we're doing Christmas and Advent hymns and we you know, I'm fine with, uh, you know, go explore these on your own by all means. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a very good pastime to just get into hymns. But we also have one that's never become cliche, but I like it for its origins. Uh, we have angels we have heard on high. 
Um, and obviously, this is probably the only Latin that many Americans would know as <laughs> uh, in Excelsis Deo. Yes. Or Gloria in Excelsis Deo. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is French in origin. Really? I didn't know yes. that. Yes. And it's a. Uh, I don't quite know why, but uh, and it's not just because I like the French. Uh, hopefully, you could. Uh, you know, literally, all of my uh, all of my European heritage is very much against the French. It is German and English, uh, so it's not like I have some sort of. What was that? Burgomeister ancestors. You know, <laughs> great, uh, great kind of uh, you know Lutheran bigwigs in their uh, berets and, and great, great stocking jackets. You know, I, uh, I can see, I can see it now. I wish, but in reality, it was uh, turnip farmers. But uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's still pretty based. I mean, you know. That's, uh, yeah, it's the uh, what would it be the uh, uh, the low class sensibilities that could become the aristocrat or something similar? Yes, um, well, they would. I mean, it's essentially, the um, the plebeians and the aristocrats are just they're basically the same thing. Just uh, fu fundamentally, they are both virtuous. Right. Um, so there you go. So um, so Gloria and Excelsis Deo um, is Luke chapter two verse uh, fourteen. Glory to God in the highest. Yeah, so mm -hmm. just that one simple uh, passage from Scripture is what spawned this hymn. You know, glory mm -hmm. to God in the highest. You can make a hymn about that. And that's exactly what the French did. Um, so old carol, old French carol. Uh, so I just like it for that simple fact. You don't, uh, we have a, just because we speak English, we get a ton of English hymns. We get a ton of hymns that come from Latin. We get um, if you're Lutheran, you get some that get translated from German. Um, this is French, and uh, you know you might also get a couple of Burgundian carols, uh, which just yes. kind of like show you the ancient heritage, a country that or a uh, kingdom that has not existed for nigh you well, know, um, hundred years. Uh, many of these sourced from um, uh, Hilary of Poitiers, yep. um, who I believe sourced many of those, including the. Burgundian hymns um, and brought them together and translated them into Latin um, right. where where they kind of spread. So, and, you know, this is a... Uh, provided that someone knew what, you know, glory to God in the highest meant in Latin, you know, right. this is basically proclaiming the gospel um, just uh, pre uh, you know, preemptively. Like, if you were to be there on the day of Christmas... Uh, this would be your gospel, you know. We have see, we've heard the angels singing. Uh, you know, Christ is born. At that point in time, that is the gospel. Um, you know, Christ has not yet died and arisen, uh, so that has yet to take place. You have to understand, but you have seen the Christ. He is real. Go and tell people. Yes. Which is which is what this hymn is, and that's what most hymns in Christmas are. Um, you know, when you get to Easter, then you get a just because of the uh, nature of the season of the uh, church of the part of the church here then you get many more references to uh you know resurrection the cross you get res uh, references to holy week mm -hmm. um because you know just chronologically that then makes sense um you can very obviously retrospectively work in the sort of easter gospel into this here um but if you are just trying to uh sing this as uh, as you would find it in scripture in Luke chapter two, it's not going to make much sense to throw the resurrection and the crucifixion in there, even though they are very important. They're not being excluded because they're not important, just because it doesn't make chronological sense. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have to have every single verse in the Bible say Christ died and was resurrected, um, just because every verse in the Bible is there for a reason. You know, we don't just have things in there just because. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Anyways, this is a. This is just something that I that I quite find very beautiful, at least on a musical level as well. Um, the sort of uh, the sort of four part choir singing Gloria that you can see right here. Uh, oh, is... yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So you, you can see everyone is moving at different times there. Mm -hmm. Start with the altos at this bottom line right here. Uh, they move first, so they start on a uh, quarter note, move eighth note, so that means that they uh, oscillate their voice uh, before everyone else. If you aren't a musician, mm -hmm. you will hear them change first. And then, after that, <clears throat> you hear the soprano, the bass, and the tenor move. The soprano keeps moving in the in the melody, 
la, la. Yeah, so you know, you get that in the soprano line. Um, the bass moves uh, slightly slower. They get quarter notes, and they sort of uh, they underscore the soprano's moving, uh, while the alto now gets to hold, kind of offset. And mm -hmm. then the tenor, as with most tenor parts, just gets to hold high notes. Uh, so, um, you know, but it's still a very beautiful thing when put all together. And in fact, when you sing it with a choir, you can tell that it sort of has the uh, latent uh, Latin origins that you might find in a French carol. Yeah. So, um, and then you get the, uh, it's a very simple thing. You repeat it again. And then when you come to the uh, ending of the first time, uh, you just cut it short. In excelsis Deo. And then you repeat the uh, Gloria. And then at the end, you get basically the same thing, but it resolves very beautifully. It's very simple. Uh, but, you know, that tends to be where I find things uh, that I appreciate beauty in. In excelsis Deo. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you get that, uh, you get that difference there. Um, and I just... Uh, you know, not nearly in depth of an analysis, which we've been doing with the other hymns, but I figured if we were doing the sort of uh, Advent, Christmas, first part of the church year, uh, or uh, not first part of the church year, near the beginning of the church year, um, right. we might as well uh, might as well hit all the all the very popular ones. Indeed. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Hat, do you have anything else that you would like to um, share? Well, um, let me think. Well, yes, I want to cover um, uh, all things bright and beautiful. Okay. Um, obviously, a very, very famous hymn. Um, now, the, it's, the, the original lyrics to it are very, very long. And many verses get cut for reasons of length. But there is a particular verse that always gets cut for political reasons. Um, okay. I'm trying to find a version that has the full uh, full thing in it. So all things right and beautiful. Uh, so anyway. Um, da -da -da. Um, I'm trying to just get the full version up here. So yes, I'm sure everyone will know all things bright and beautiful. It's it's a very it's a it's quite a wonderful hymn. Um, it's um it's it was originally written as a children's hymn by Mrs. Cecil Alexander, um, who was an Anglo-Irish um sort of um gentlewoman and um and 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 hymn writer and poet and such. Um, and uh, funnily enough. Um, it's believed, it's believed by some, that the line about the purple-headed mountain, the river running by, mm -hmm. is attributed to the Sugarloaf Mountain and the River Usk, which run through Abergavenny, which is where I'm from, in Wales, um, oh. the, one, the wonderful town. However, it is also claimed that these refer to the views from Markery Castle in, in Sligo, and also... Uh, Dunster in Somerset, which is in England. So there are several different claims as to what exactly inspired those lyrics. Obviously, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick that it's uh, <laughs> it was the it was the Sugarloaf Mountain and the and the, the River Usk of Wales, which is because it's literally where I, where I grew up. Um, so but uh, yes. I will uh, throw up a picture of this uh, just because it's so long. I might I'm able to fit the whole thing into one. Yeah, picture. The, the original is long. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I do find it. This is one of the, at least the version I have. The hymn ends with an amen, mm -hmm. and I, uh, you know, I quite like that. I, I that that is a uh, yes. pure preference, and uh, you know, obviously it's good to say amen whenever you beseech mm -hmm. God of something. But um, yeah, I I just like it when hymns end that way. Just it uh, so, focuses. I will say this hymn with the original uh, verse is still in it. Uh, you, well, I'm talking about verse three, just above right now. Um, that basically is a, ah. a, a this is this is a defense of the social hi hierarchy as laid out by God. Yes. Now I very much favor this verse, and because I believe, obviously, I as a, as a reactionary, I believe in social hierarchy in general. Um, true, true social hierarchy that is, as in as in r rule rule by the worthy, um, and. I believe this is also a very, a very Christian idea, which is laid out both implicitly and explicitly um, throughout Christian um, scripture. Um, mm -hmm. I don't agree with the interpretation of Christ as like this proto-Marxist, um, give all the wealth to the poor kind of thing, because it's really quite a heretical reading of what is obviously not that, I believe. Um, 
um I, I i i do believe in in traditional social order so yeah but this verse is often not not in um not in in the hymn and for for, for those who are listening rather than, than watching the the visuals i will read it for you it goes the rich man in his castle the poor man at his gate god made them high or lowly and ordered their estate now the reason that this is even more controversial is because, as I mentioned, uh, the woman in question was a Anglo-Irish aristocrat um, and one of the Protestant uh, planter ascendancy. And it was assumed that this line <laughs> was referring to the social order specifically of Ireland, um, i.e. that the uh, Protestant god, per se, had ordered that the um protestant gentry would rule over the catholic masses and this was necessary and right um again that's not that's not explicitly brought brought out in the text that's just what was assumed right um and um so i believe that um she also um wrote uh, a verses in the english hymnal um and she she made it she made a a similar reference which in in which in which she said the poor man in his straw roofed cottage the rich man in his lordly hall and then it rhymes with the line he listens and he answers all i.e basically it doesn't matter whether you're very poor or very rich your prayers are weighted uh, equally in god so right she probably wasn't quite the sort of vicious uh sort of social hierarchicalist that she's been made out to be um, right i was about to say if i just read this yeah if i read this just with like no context of when it was written or by whom uh this seems to be sort of comforting in that if you were uh, like you are uh low because god made you that way not because of something you did necessarily or yes or perhaps of as judgment perhaps or something like that but ultimately you well, do have god running things well i mean so, I, I i always take it as a given that wealth is essentially irrelevant to one's faith in that you know yeah there's there's a reason that monks basically give up most earthly wealth right you know um and in fact i do agree with the message um in, in that that christ gave that um often wealth is an impediment to good faith yeah um because it gives you more opportunity to lose yourself and to sin um you know the whole the whole the the infamous thing about the it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven right yeah the, the idea that the rich will always distract themselves with earthly pleasures but i i'm not i'm not like um a stalinist and that I, I i don't believe that like wealth itself is bad you know right. you can you can be rich and also charitable and also a good christian um but it's not it's 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 no sin to just be wealthy of its own. Right. You can't have um, a hierarchy without some form of wealth somewhere. Well, yeah. I mean wealth wealth exists, you know. It's not yeah. it's not like we can just say abolish wealth and make it Even if we wealth. yeah, even if we got rid of every single human thing, there would still be natural wealth, yes, which is exactly. the uh, yeah, so at that point you have to start destroying creation because God made it wealthy. Well, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> there are there are there are there are rich men and there are poor men and we can't do yes. anything about that. So, um exactly. Yes, but you know, so this this line has been struck out of pretty much all versions from the sort of mid nineteen hundreds onwards, which which I think is wrong, um, because I think it's a yeah. beautiful hymn, and on, on, honestly, I, I believe there is fundamental metaphysical truth in it because it sings about um, all the creatures of the earth, all the flowers and the birds, the as I said, as I said, the mountain and the river and the sunset and the fruit in the garden, you know, all these great things that we've been blessed with, and. You know, I believe that hierarchy is is fundamentally a blessing. Yes. Because, you know, as Gomez says, the only place where everybody is equal is hell. So, you know, um, I suppose if you're not taking a Dante's conception. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. yes, but essentially hell is the only place where everyone is equal. So hierarchy is fundamentally a good thing. I, I do believe that. So it is true to include hierarchy and rank along with things like mountains and rivers and and, and and the weather and the trees and the meadows and the and, and the birds because you know it's it's a good thing that god has gave us and we can't change it you know um right. and so, you know, if there yeah. wasn't differentiation if there wasn't variety which ultimately which definitionally means that there is inequality uh mm -hmm. then there's nothing really to appreciate no exactly um and i do think that 
it's also quite an insult to a notable hymn writer to just strike the verses out. I mean, I, 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 I or at the very least, strike them out because of like political exactly squabbles. I, I like we I, mentioned I, at the beginning, you can edit things to keep them doctrinally sound for the church, but or, that's or not perhaps, what's happening here. Or, or perhaps, I mean, if your mass is only like an hour long, you perhaps want to shorten, um, sh sh shorten some hymns, which is fine. But striking out a verse and then and then putting in all, all, all the rest of it just seems wrong to me. You know, right. if I if, if I had written a poem. And it was republished with various verses just struck out because they hit because they hit wrong notes for certain people. I'd be very very angry. Um, so, you know. <laughs> I I think apoplectic might be the uh, yeah, proper exactly. way to put it. I um, guess uh, almost inexcusable. Um, so, I uh, the hymn book that I have actually has like an end of the day or end of service section, right? And which is also where we see "Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer." Um, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also a, it's a English Welsh folk song, uh, mm -hmm. if I can find it real quick. Um, and it is probably one of my favorite hymns in here, despite the fact that it almost has like, you know, it was kind of just thrown in here kind of as an afterthought, but I need to find it really quickly. And we will go over that after we go out over the super chats and the chat itself. Uh, just okay, because very good. I like the idea of leaving content at the end. Uh, so that, you know, people that do donate with something like a message or whatnot uh, actually, uh, actually has a, <laughs> they also, have a reason to. I, I noticed that somebody in the chat, uh, our friend Spasticus Autisticus, has yeah. said that we can't cover these hymns without talking about Good King Wenceslas. And yes, I promise we will talk about it before the end because it's a fantastic belter hymn that is also very, very po poetical and... If, if you get a bunch of Welsh people to sing it, then then the bit that goes, gathering winter fuel is always incredible. Uh, <laughs> so yes. Uh, yeah, one moment. I just have to find where it is because it wasn't where I thought it was. Uh, but uh, by all means, we can start looking at the uh, Super Chats themselves. Uh, and then we'll go over the basic chat if anything caught us. So we have one gentleman here, Wotan005, for $10 without a message. Thank you, sir. Very generous. That is very um, much appreciated. Yeah, and I guess uh, that is uh, what it allows me to justify doing this is uh, donations from people. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I would have to uh, quit not only this and other things, but actually do something that generates money uh, just because of the, the nature of... Uh, the nature of nature, if you will. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, we have a cringe walker for 10 US dollars. I went to Catholic school, but my music teacher was Protestant. He was this absolute unit of a man on a burger wheelchair, and he would tell us every week how Luther is the start of pop music. I mean, yeah, taking a very broad definition of pop music would certainly make sense, uh, just because, uh, you know, before he... then you obviously had a uh, saying that as a as a as a positive thing like it's... well okay so pop music if you just take it in the broad sense is just whatever music people popularly know yeah you know, right. so, which is why if you go back to pop music in the 30s it's jazz and very well composed jazz if i might add but if you go in the modern day it's just you know whatever the media pushes and whoever gets silenced and whatnot so right. Um, there were uh, Germany, and in Germany at the time of Luther, you had very popularly known songs at the time. So you could say under this definition, pop music existed. Um, mm. And they were just, uh, they were meant to be sung in taverns, you know, tavern songs. Yeah. Um, everyone knew them. Uh, it was just part of the culture. It's swill your beer and clank your mug on the table right. and sing along. Great, great fun if you've ever been to a pub, pub sing along. Right. Whenever Luther started publishing his hymns, uh, half of which tended to just be like a uh, a musical version of like the Lord's Prayer or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, then suddenly that enters the popular musical consciousness. Like people start singing that or knowing the theme, or and it gets sung just in towns. Um, mm -hmm. Which you know, if you're a German peasant, it's a bit harder to do that with like a Latin uh, chant. Yeah. Uh, which which the the adherents of the Latin chant would say that's by design, um, but. You know, this uh, this put uh, at the very least Christianity into pop music, whereas beforehand it was much rarer or mentioned in like ballads or uh, or uh, you know music uh, from those uh, from traveling musicians. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that sense, I would say it's a good thing. Uh, you know, but perhaps there might be you know, should there be pop music at all, probably would be a question from you potentially. Right. <laughs> uh, and 
640. Okay. And then we also have uh, Spasticus Autisticus donating to us once again two pounds sterling. And did those feet in ancient time. No, no, it's and did those feet in, in ancient, ancient time. time. I mean, to be fair, we've not really covered Jerusalem today, but we will when it makes sense because we kind of Jerusalem could be a stream of its own. I mean, yes, it's it's that prolific, I think. And Um, in fact, if I can like harass Mr. John D enough, I would like to have mm. him on for that just because he is a uh, he is a connoisseur of poetry, we might say. Mm -hmm. So, um. But it just we, I literally messaged uh, Panama Hat yesterday and said, "Hey, how about we just do a cozy stream on him tomorrow?" And uh, he said, "Yes, of course." Always. <laughs> uh, so we didn't have a plan, and this sort of just turned into us, you know, going through the uh, sort of Advent Christmas hymns with a couple of other ones uh, interspersed. Mm-hmm. So um, if we do do uh, Jerusalem, I might, you know, we might just dedicate a stream to that on its own, just because it's a, it's Blake. We can analyze that one for hours. It's a big one. It's a big one to do. I think yeah. um, if anybody remembers the Andrew Marvell stream that I did with AA on the garden, it would be more like that, I think, where we go through verse by verse and talk about it in depth right? rather than just a general covering of it. But I think it's fair to say that Turnip and I both deeply, deeply love that hymn yep. um, and, the, and, the, and the poem that it's sourced from. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, that was not in my musical tradition until like a couple of years ago. The Baptists mm-hmm. in America don't sing it. The Lutherans in America don't sing it. Um, so, uh, it's a, it's a very uniquely English hymn and I absolutely love it. (laughs) It's considered because, um, England is the only country, um, in the union that does not have its own official, um, anthem, uh, national anthem. Right. And it's been considered the, the unofficial national anthem of England for some time. And uh, in fact, I believe King George V actually tried to get the national anthem changed from, God save the king to Jerusalem. Um, oh man, that... because because he much preferred it. Um, <laughs> because of course, God save the king is a is, is a royal anthem, not technically a national anthem in the same way. Right. Um, but so he yeah he 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 wanted to change it to 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 that. King George V once again proving to be a better monarch than uh, half yes. the others. I think I think it does it does smell slightly of kind of populist modernizing, but at the same time it's such an epic song that I would almost be okay with it. I, I mean, it's ain't okay. Uh we have, you know, writings from, you know, Christians in the 6th century appealing to different members of the church and even the pope on basis mm-hmm. of nationality. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't say that makes them populist. Uh you can obviously make the claim that Jerusalem is trying to extend some sort of unearned virtue to people. You know, just well, by virtue of them being it. But I think the other issue was as well that it's often been remarked by some people. I'm not going to comment either way on this, so do not take this as my opinion on mm-hmm. on the song. But it's been said by some that "God Save the King" is for a national anthem. It's very kind of slow, and it is it is reverent, but it can be plodding. And oh, yeah. I, I believe that George V, or it may have been Edward the Seventh as well may have actually collaborated with some composers to try and get the beat per minute raised basically because (laughs) obviously if you're the king you will have to hear that anthem all the time basically and i imagine you do get pretty sick of it after not long so and and i believe in fact george george v banned people singing it at um buckingham palace at special event He, he just banned it he was like, "Stop singing! I'm sick of it. Just stop singing! <laughs> stop singing! God save the king! For God's sake! I'm so sick of it." Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, I believe he wanted something that was a bit more kind of inspiring, I suppose, because of course, as I said, "God save the king" is very reverent and is very powerful if performed in a certain way. But um, I believe some people have, have criticized it on those grounds. So. Uh... So. Yeah, I mean. I just like it because there's sort of like a uh, esotericism or like a uh, you know hidden you know Englishness that uh, gets talked about in it. Like obviously it's talking about that subject, uh, but obviously if you're an American and raised in sort of like the American culture, you don't believe in esotericism mm-hmm. or anything unique about Englishness, even if you are yourself English. So Sad. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, um, and then we'll, well uh, just before we. Uh, Go over the last couple hymns. I was just going to, if I could just ask one last thing on that. Um, Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with what the fifth monarchists were? I know the name. 
and I think it um, might have come up in one of my AP classes, maybe. Well, they were they were a sect of religious radicals in the Civil War, who believed yeah, okay. that who, who believed that England was the fifth the fifth monarchy. Yeah. So okay, you know how yeah. you know how you have like the four um, kingdoms of God of God, right? Yep. Well, it's it was believed that they believed that England was the fifth, and it, that they had to remove the king and the heretical um, institutions, and then God would restore his rule over England. Um, and I wonder, do you think that um, there's any hint of that in Jerusalem at all? Um, okay, so in relation to removing a king, at least from the hymn itself, I'm not going to comment on the other parts of the work just because I don't have Blake memorized. Mm -hmm. uh, it does not seem to me that it's entirely there, but uh, the idea that England is like the holy, you know, a holy special kingdom uh, definitely is there. Like that's the, uh, I, I would say half and half. Okay. Um, I, I think it would be very difficult to construe uh, uh, Jerusalem as uh, being about potentially removing or even being used as justification for removing a monarch because mm -hmm. you know, removing a monarch for the majority of English history is not a very English thing to do. Very much, no. So, um, yeah, I I, uh, I feel like that the only, the the overlap is the fact that they both see England as a uh, holy kingdom. So, mm -hmm. um, so with that, just a couple of quick things from the chat that caught my eye. Uh, the Church of England's music is great, yes. Uh, it is. I quite like their hymns. Uh, I, know, Ryan, I, know, I know certain autistic people who insist that... Um, uh, things have have really gone into decline for the last sort of hundred years, yeah. and uh, yes, I agree. The quality of the music is not quite as good, but it's still grand. You know, the the quality of the of the chorale and the hymnal, the organ playing, and the bands. The the, 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 Church, the Church of England is still, for all its great faults, still pretty good at music. So we, yes. I, we can give it that. So uh, Ryan has evolved into a potato. I see uh, that is not a potato. That is a turnip. <laughs> <laughs> demonic uh, ai art uh, <laughs> yeah so coconut mask almond that is a turnip uh, his, uh, <laughs> yeah I got, I got locked out of my twitter account for people that don't know and uh so this is i tried to pick something solist uh to uh, kind of give that punished turnip aesthetic and uh cringe walker our dear friend and subversive has uh given me this uh, and i quite i i found it awesome that it was just managed to be replicated um so do turnips or sorry, do Lutherans sing Rock of Ages? Uh, yes, it is in the hymnal. Uh, so uh, we have that. I'm very familiar with that one. Uh, well, I'm wasn't either before becoming Lutheran because the Baptist church that I had, it was the hymnal was very old, and everyone in the congregation was much older, right. uh, save for the people that had children. So you kind of had like a, you know, either a, the majority of people were very old, and the next highest category were young. Uh, I didn't have people in between. So all the hymns we sang were basically really old in the Baptist church, and now in the Lutheran church, it's new to me. So um, okay. love the new logo, Young Squire. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have our good friend Joshua Ham that joins us once again. Uh, yeah. I'll, so. Howdy, plebs. <laughs> so as, as we have said, there is no shame in being a plebeian. Plebeians yeah. and <laughs> aristocrats are one the same. It is the disgusting middle-class merchant here that you want to avoid, so... So, celebrate your plebeian peasantiness and we also have a, a request uh, i don't know if anyone has asked you but can you do a stream about the popular house of the dragon series and give your take on it i have not no heard of this. no we're not gonna watch your <laughs> tv show and give a take on it i it's have a, not heard a, of this no it, it's that's not what this channel is it's a it's a <laughs> it's like a it's like a game of thrones spin-off tv show ah uh, okay. I'm, I'm no no i don't i don't have time to waste I... watching normie slop tv shows no this is a um... channel where we talk about culture and history <laughs> and hymns and all good things we're not watching your awful spin-off game of thrones rubbish tv show no so... that's my take on it there you go um, so uh and last thing of course uh you can't cover these hymns without talking about good king once is lost so Mr. Hat, uh, if you would like, we will do this, and then I will throw up the ending hymn that I had in Let's mind, uh, and then that will be the end of our stream after you have shilled. Well, um, Cooking Wenceslas, uh, of course, is... Um, I have to get some lore in it up here, so it's one. It's always been one of my favorites. Um, I will uh, throw up the uh, lyrics as soon as I get a good uh, picture. 
Um, it tells the story of a bohemian king yep. who is braving the harsh winter weather to give arms to his poor peasants. And I, I, I love that because, you know, there's something deeply Christian and like European about that. You know, the, the king in middle Europe braving the winter and giving, giving things to his peasants. And the, the, I, we, we used to sing it in Latin a lot, but the English lyrics are, are very good. I love that, you know, bring me flesh and bring me wine, you know, like, you know, um, and uh, we, we would often do a, a version in church where um, everybody would sing like the, um, the, the exposition lines, mm -hmm. then all the things, then all the lines by King Wenceslas would be only the men in the church. Then all the lines from the page boy would be all the women. I so see. it would be yeah. like, it was almost acting, it was, it was incredible. I, I lo love good King Wenceslas. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great story. Bring me pine logs hither. That's great. Oh. <laughs> yeah. it's such, such such powerful words, you know. So I, this was I actually was not taught this growing up. Oh no! You what, so, what, what, what a deprived childhood. I mean, well, I mean, so I didn't get it from the Baptist church, and the Lutherans uh, take the melody and turn it into a hymn called "Gentle Mary Laid Her Child." Oh really? Yes. Gentle Mary laid her child in a lowly manger, and it kind of, it, uh, re it's the same thing, but it recounts the uh, sort of the lowliness of the birth of Christ. Uh, you know, the, you know, the God Himself, the Son of God, being laid in a manger in a stable. Yeah. So, uh, so um, I, I I will say for a bit more law, um, there was a real uh, King Wenceslaus, um, mm -hmm. who was the Duke of Bohemia. Um, from 921 until roughly 935, but we don't know very much about him. All, all our information on it, so so he died and was considered a martyr and a saint, and there was actually a cult of, Wen of Wenceslaus, which rose up in Bohemia and in England. Um, and all the information we have on him basically comes from um, four kind of biographies of him of sort of written text about him that were that were, that were, that were being passed around basically um had geographies um and mm. they basically were almost like philosophical tr treatments on the idea of the righteous king whose power comes from his piety you know so very kind of christian very european idea um and um a preacher from the 12th century commented that but his deeds, I think, you know better than I could tell you. For as his as is read in his passion, no one doubts that, rising from every night in his noble bed, with bare feet and only one chamberlain, he went round the God's churches and gave alms generously to widows, orphans, those in prison, and afflicted by every great difficulty, so much so that he was considered not a prince, but a father of all the wretched. And uh, this legend was confirmed by uh, Pope Pius the second in the 1460s i believe mm -hmm. um and who also um copied many of the the rituals of king Wenceslaus. so that pope also would walk um barefoot in ice and snow um and give arms to to to, to the poor basically um you know great great gr gr christian tradition which i think we should yeah. survive, actually. you know I um, the now this was also back at the time where you knew that if someone was begging they needed it yes um, the issue that a lot of American towns have is that people can oftentimes uh, become professional panhandlers, is what they're called. Um, but that is no justification for getting rid of almsgiving. Nope. Always give so. alms to the poor. Um, and I, I often, I mean, I know that it will probably reach many more people, but I do slightly resent the fact that many Christians... They all, all they do is they they go to church and they put money in the poor box or they give to the great charities. But the issue is that I think it kind of removes you. Like it's right. it's it's one thing to kind of just put like five pounds in the poor box at Christmas and say, okay, well I've done my charity work. It's another thing to go out in bare feet in the winter and <laughs> personally give food and money to, to to starving people. You know, right? And I mean, that's not that's not to say that giving money to the poor box is bad. It's no. just uh, what we are trying to articulate. It's a very, it's a very different kind of alms giving. Yeah, for the last couple or the last three Thanksgivings, I think, and this is where that uh, turnip I have to drive meme came from. Uh, the last few <laughs> Thanksgivings that I've uh, that I've had, um, I've spent it uh, delivering food to the uh, you know the you know the homes of people that are struggling 
with money, basically. You know, the absolute lowest uh, class of people, at least in Oklahoma, uh, some of which that live in trailers or shacks or stuff like that. Very, it's run down. They have money to fix things. Most of them are oftentimes uh, elderly, mm-hmm. you know, kind of just been left behind. Uh, and I, we basically for uh, th- those Thanksgivings, we just uh, the churches in the town get together and we go deliver food to them. I'm not telling the story to say, look at how pious I am. I hope I would never say such a thing, uh, but rather. Uh, you get something very, uh, something you can't get anywhere else when you go deliver food to people that need it, and then you say the Lord's Prayer with them, and then you just talk to mm-hmm. them. Um, that's something that you don't get when you just put uh, money into no, the offering plate it, it or is, into the poor box. You're, you're kind of one step removed. Um, I mean, I I um I always give to any homeless that are in Cardiff in the city, and there are lots of them. Um Quite sadly, um, I don't want to get too political, but it's always quite sad to see that um, there are, you know, a million immigrants of the third world arriving every year. <laughs> all of them, all of them are given free housing, yeah. and uh, all of the all of the homeless that you see in the streets of Wales are white Welshmen, um, yep. which is and often a very sad thing to see. Similarly, um, in Oklahoma, um, a lot of your a lot of your uh, usual immigrant populations tend to get a lot of assistance, mm-hmm. and a lot of the poor whites uh, tend to live place. in trailer parks and uh, you know, yes, just um, basically destitute. So I I always carry or when I'm well, I'm, occasionally I am completely broke, but uh, when I do have <laughs> um, spare cash on me, I always carry a pocket of, of of pound coins, and if I get stopped by a beggar and ask for money, I often will give it to them, with some exceptions because there are some that are. Um, how how should we say they they, um, well for example just the other night um, on Wednesday I want to mm-hmm. say it was um, I was at the pub in Cardiff with some friends we were sat outside um, I was I was uh, smoking smoking my pipe that's why and uh, we got asked about five or six times by people coming around the corner and you know we only had so much money on us I mean we 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 gave money to the first two. And the next two, we just have to say, I'm sorry, we just, we don't have any cash on us at all. And then another one came, came along who had a part of his nose missing, um, due to presumably to the use of cocaine, and um, didn't ask for money. Mm-hmm. But he said he had really bad dry mouth um, because he'd just woken up. And obviously, if he had dry, I presume he woke up from some kind of hangover. Um, and he said, could we buy him a Coke? And I said, well, if you go into the pub, they'll give you a glass of water for nothing. And he, and he got very angry and insisted he wanted a Coke. Right, and I okay. said, well, I'm sorry. I, just, I mean, yeah, the choosing you know, beggar. Right. Ex- 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 exactly. So, so, I mean, you know. uh, anyway, we're getting very, very, very right. sidetracked. But yes, good, good King Wenceslas, the king who goes out. And of course, there's that wonderful bit where the young page boy is being, you know, battered by the cold. And he, you know, he says, I can't go on. It's too cold. I'm freezing to death. And what, and Wenceslas says, tread in my footsteps, you know, and tread in them boldly, tread thou in them boldly, you know. And um, so he does. And, the, and the, the young squire is warned by this. And I, I often think that, you know, it's what it's a kind of tale of um, of sort of that mysticalness that saints have, you know, like the the the, the abilities that that, 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 that that saints have, like how, for example, um, uh, Thomas Aquinas was said to levitate with, with ecstasy, etc. Um, someone like St. Saint, Saint Wenceslaus would be able to warm somebody if you tread in, tread in his footsteps. But I also think there's a very strong Christian allegory there, you know, mm-hmm. you know, because of course we, we, we follow God and we, and of course we, we're told to follow in the footsteps of Christ, aren't we? Yes. And, you know, that, that is almost a, a kind of, a kind of poetic rendering of a, of a life of devotion to Christ where your heart is, 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 failing in the cold and the night, but you tread in the steps of Christ and you find yourself warmed and you find yourself given more strength and energy to carry on. You know, I think there's a very clear Christian allegory there. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The power of Christ helping you or, or in some cases causing you to keep walking forward. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that is very good. And I don't mean to cut that short there because we could talk about that for a long time. It's just, we are nearing slightly the end yes, yes, and there is one more, uh, that I would like to show here. Um, wrong one. Hold on. Yes, here we go. So um, this is called "Sent Forth by God's Blessing." Uh, it's two verses, uh, but you know, two pages as well, uh, and also slightly musically complex. 
Send forth thy God's blessing, our true faith confessing. The people of God from his dwelling take leave. The supper is ended. O oh, now be extended the fruits of this service in all who believe. The seed of his teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. His grace did invite us, his love shall unite us, to work for God's kingdom and answer his call. That's the first verse. Very good. Now, you, being over on the aisles, ha might recognize the tune. Uh, it's the Ash Grove. Oh, I see. Okay. And yes. Lord, by God's blessing, our true faith confessing, the people. Yeah, yeah. 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 So this is, this is the Ash Grove, and um, um, this would this would not be the only hymn to have its tune uh, be the Ash Grove either. Correct. Yes. No, um, but this one I really loved uh, because it was the first time I had heard the tune, and I absolutely, I absolutely love the lyrics. And it is uh, the verses are much longer, but there's only two of them, so you know you don't have to worry about am I confusing the verses because they're both separate stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one's talking, one's focusing on like just ending the Lord's Supper, and the other one's going talking about you know now going out and applying Christianity. You know, go be a Christian in your life to other people. Yes. Um, now. The other thing was, uh, the first time I had heard this, I actually played the trumpet. I did not sing it. And I absolutely loved the melody um, because I played the, you know, ba basically the melody to the Ash Grove to this hymn. That was why I was playing. You can't play multiple things at the same time on a trumpet for people that aren't musical. Um, so I absolutely love this. Um, and it, and it, to me, it sounded very English. <laughs> And I asked yes. the uh, the music director at my church, I asked, like, you know, what's, what's the origin of this tune? And he said, oh, it's the Ash Grove. And, he, and of course, since it, we're Americans, he's a very British. So, um, yeah, this is, and it usually in churches, despite the fact that at the top here, um, it says the Lord's Supper. Uh, so Lutherans have a part specifically dedicated to communion. I see. Or the okay. Lord's Supper in their hymnals. This will just get used at the end of a service because, you know, most services, you have the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very end of the service, you sing this. Um, then you know a postlude. If someone plays a postlude. People walk out of the church, talk to each other, congregate, go yeah. to studies. But this is the last thing that you would hear during that service, right. and it is beautiful. Like yes, indeed. Uh, especially on the organ, because there's a ton of different organ arrangements for this. Wonderful. So, uh, I I just figured, being as we're ending the stream, uh, this would be something very nice to end it on. And as you see, it's not just the melody that has some sort of complexity. Um, the tenor. And classic sort of English Welsh style is just sitting on a ton of high notes uh, <laughs> relative to most male voices. Yes, um, and you're just expected to keep singing that very loudly, very clearly. Oh, there's uh, there's if people who are familiar with the film with the film Zulu <laughs> will know the moment when uh, the Welsh private Owens um, they have a good they're, bass they're, section. Well, yes, because they're 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 hearing the Zulus do their war chant, and the officer remarks to him, uh, "Do you think the Welsh can do better than that?" And he says. Well, they they got a very good bass section, mind, but but no top tenors, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, because of course, you know the, the 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 backbone of the male voice choir is the, is your top tenors. So uh, yes, you, right. Otherwise, you can't get away with any of this. So you know, there it's a very simple melody for the tenors, so which you can see on the bottom line here throughout mm -hmm. most of this, and then you get to the next page, and suddenly the tenors have a lot more movement and variation. I don't know yeah. if you can see right here. Yeah. 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 Same with up here. Very, it's fun to sing. It's beautiful. Uh, the lyrics are very nice, and it's also fun to play on instruments. And you know, given that we're about to end the stream right here, uh, I thought it would be very fitting. So indeed. Um, also, well, I was going to say you you mentioned the old um, turnip wave thing there. Do yeah. you do you think that the the end card for the stream should just be the, the turnip <laughs> wave thing? Like it just it just play it just plays yeah. out. You know, it. I've been thinking to put out a call for an update because it's me it's me predicting that there was going to be a bunch of uh, court finagling in 2020 <laughs> after we had no clue what was going there. No, it might have been it was Thanksgiving. It was 20, it, was, it was the end so, of 2020, I think. Though. Yeah, it was it was right on Thanksgiving. I remember that. So, um we just had like a bunch of arguments in the deep lore and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh that was you know, taken from a UO around that time. Yeah, it was a UO, and we had no clue what the hell was supposed to happen with the elections. No. And I basically just said, if it goes to the court, expect a ton of finagling, especially in uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, and then ultimately expect the Supreme Court to do nothing. 
And, you know, that's what, it's a bit dated now. It's, it uh, is, I suppose. Yeah. You know, people, people looking back on it now will think that it's just so obvious that that's what happened. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was speculating at the time, I swear. Yes. Um, so, uh, but, you know, if anyone out there uh, would like to make an end card, if, and uh, actually, whenever we get to the end of the stream, um, if you look at the description, we have the Find My Friends link for both me and Panama Hat. If you go to mine, I have a Telegram channel where I now reside after being locked out of my Twitter account. Um, Pan or, uh, Cringe Walker has posted the original uh, the original Turnip Wave meme. Um, and, you know, the song is fine. The, the, the visual is perfectly fine. It's just my voice in it is very outdated. It's from two years ago from the election. We need something a bit more hard-hitting and universal and true. We do, we do. We, uh, we, so. we need the voice of 2022. So. so if anyone would like to go to that Telegram channel, uh, take a, just gander upon the, uh, the, um, uh, the original that Panama Hat so graciously provided me on a Thanksgiving day, uh, <laughs> we can, uh, perhaps we'll have like a fun stream where we just go through the different types, uh, yes, the different uh, submissions. Uh, <laughs> and of course we get uh, Spasticus Autisticus I'm guessing Turnip's 2020 voice is also about not the higher well, I mean, uh, he, he was only 12 I mean you know it, you <laughs> I'm a big bright 14 year old now you know, have he's, to really, he's really matured very well but, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah well uh, yeah, well, maybe we'll have a stream dedicated to that but go to the find my friends link in the description if you don't know what that is uh, join the Telegram channel um, and join the chat there as well. Uh, hopefully, we can have an influx of people uh, that have no clue what is why I have just gone so uncharacteristically silent on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but with that being said, uh, Mr. Uh, Panama Hat, would you uh, would you like to uh, shill yourself? Um, well, all the usual places. You check out my channel. It's been a bit follow there for a while because I've been extraordinarily busy, um, but hopefully I will get back to making videos soon, and also getting my second channel off the ground with some rambling videos. Um, I was going to do a response to the the news items on Tuesday's UO, but it was just too bleak, frankly. Um, <laughs> so I thought to move on from that. Um, but yes, uh, basically you can just go to my channel, just type in uh, Panama House on YouTube, and I'm sure it's linked in the description. Uh, there's my Twitter as well, which has not been banned yet. So, um, in fact, I, I think I'm one of the few people that's not been banned yet. So, I, so I'm going to have to sort of up up the spice and uh, see see if I can see if I can get that threshold banned. <laughs> You'll um, have to join us on Telegram, though. We can't just go yes. without Panama Hat. We have I to have him somewhere. All right, I may have to get on Telegram soon then. But yes, it, um, it's also much more longer form, much more fitting of your style, allows for true, much more pontificating. Hmm. You, you 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 are you are sort of you're selling me on the idea now. Um, yeah. So well, actually, I do, I do have a Telegram that I use as a backup communication for uh, my fiance over in America. So mm. I could just add that, I suppose. Um, but anyway, we're getting sidetracked here. So yes, um, keep an eye out because this year I will have uh, a collection of poetry. I always read a collection of poetry at the end of the year. This year's is far more substantial than last year's. It is called. It will be called. Uh, either India Inc. or Metaphysics. I haven't decided yet. But um, it will it will have some far more he he heavy hitters than last year's volume, which was more kind of uh, uh, light verse. Um, so yes, I hope people uh, enjoy that. And uh, if I may have a book of essays coming out as well, but that's to be decided. And I have a novel which is close to completion, but that probably won't be out for next year. It's also worth saying, though, you've also made a songbook, which is very relevant to uh, what we've uh, what we've been talking about today. Chestertonian, if I remember correctly, well, right? Yes, I, I I believe that that song is the essence of poetry fundamentally. So that's why I called you know that, like lots of my poems are just called like something and then song, like or song of whatever, because that's fundamentally I believe that poets. Should consider themselves to be writing music, basically. Um, so where might one find the songbook of our our esteemed Panama hat? Oh, oh, wait, no, hang on, no, you're talking about the Chris Gard thing. Yes. Ah, so no, I did, I didn't. Or is okay. that different? So, so yes, I was, I was talking about the uh, collection I released last, last year, which is called Winter Songs. Oh, um, I mean that works as well. I mean, also yeah, on that, topic. That, that, that that as well. But the the what I I've done a collaboration recently with Chris Gard where um, I asked him about if he wanted to record some famous poems I like um, in his great kind of shanty musical style. 
And he said, sure, send him over. So I sent him. So I, I arranged and, and made some edits to a collection of Kipling and Chesterton poems, um, edited them slightly to make them more singable, basically, um, and uh, s- s- sent them over to him as a songbook. And he was really enthusiastic and he, he, he read a lot of these poems for the first time and loved them. So over the past year, he's been recording his versions of them. So we've had uh, White Man's Burden and Tommy and Shilling a Day and the Cider Song and most recently um, Gunga Din. All fantastic. Uh, Chris Gard is a fantastic singer and musician and all around talented. And he, he, he works incredibly hard on these and puts them together in remarkably short periods of time as well. So yes, please do check out. Uh, uh, it's at uh, Chris Gard Morbakai on Twitter and uh, the same name on YouTube. Um, please do check check him out. And yes, he's right. uh, he, he he often gives me f- uh, far too much credit in the in in the making of those. All I all I really did was just arrange some <laughs> some good poems. Uh, but yes, um, do check that out because that's been very fun. And my uh, personal favorite would be the Rolling English Road. Ah uh, yes. So before the uh, Roman went to Rye or out to Seven Strode, the Rolling English drunkard made the Rolling English Road, reeling road a rolling road that rambles round the Shire. And after him, the parson ran, the sexton and the squire. Yes. You have to, you have to stop me. That that <laughs> I love that one. So by all means, great, you check that great out. poem, great song. Yeah. And if you are, uh, being as we are stopping much earlier than we usually do, our good friend, the Prudentialist, uh, and I will send the link in chat right now, uh, is doing a stream in about one hour and 39 minutes now, uh, noon central time, uh, on nuclear weapons. And his... Very astute geopolitical knowledge will be on full display there. I am absolutely certain, very competent in that. Well, so I'll be, I'll be I'll be tuning into that over a pipe and a cup of tea in not, yes. not long. So go pay our friend uh, Prudentialist a visit. Uh, you know we very rudely, and I am realized this ran over him last week when we were doing our Kenya stream. So uh, you know I have told him to spam me now, and uh, we. <laughs> <laughs> nuclear weapons don't exist. <laughs> uh, that's some old lore. That's a topic for another day. <laughs> uh, so, um, but yeah, we so rudely ran over him last week. Uh, he, we have now collaborated to where I will, uh, I will uh, send you all over to him if we come close. Uh, now you guys get a break in between. Once again, he starts in an hour and thirty nine minutes at noon Central Time. So, uh, by all means, go and check out our friend there, uh, Prudentialist. Very good man, uh, who can. You know, speak with equal proficiency on geopolitical matters and on cultural and religious matters. So, uh, go listen to him if you, uh, if you by all means want to listen to more. So, yes, indeed. With that, I believe that we are ready to sign out. Anything else, Mister Hat? No, I don't believe so. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and um, see you next time. All righty. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>